Okay. Assalamualaikum. Good morning. Maayong aga, magandang umaga sa lahat. Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today. This is the first day of our multi-stakeholder discussion that seeks to envision good governance and fiscal mining policy in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao, which we refer to as BARM throughout the discussion. My name is Jelson Garcia, an independent consultant that led the BARM Mining Governance Assessment Initiative, a project of Bantay Kita that organized this event. I will be your moderator for the entire discussion today and tomorrow. We are pleased to co-host this two-day event with BARM's Ministry of the Environment, Natural Resources, and Energy, a key agency that has expanded mandates because they also cover energy, and the Institute of Autonomy and Governance, known to most of you as the leading policy center on governance and human security in Southern Philippines with a recognized impact on sustainable peace and development. Very quickly, let me run you through the basics and house rules so we're all on the same page about the flow and how you can engage with your questions and insights a little later. First, on the why and what of this discussion. Second, what's the flow, who's speaking, and how you can provide feedback. On the why and how. So in June and July 2021, the Bantay Kita organized the stakeholder consultations and validation in Tawi-Tawi in Cotabato City about the report that laid out the findings on the quality of mining governance in the Bangsamoro region. The study was undertaken in 2018 until 2019. So there was a uh, overlap between the DEN arm and the, 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 the BARM using an assessment or benchmarking framework called the Natural Resource Charter which has been used in many resource-rich countries and regions where governments find its importance in informing the reform of their oil, gas, and mining policies, institutions, or in improving their practices. Stakeholder representatives from BARM's policymaking and executive bodies, mining companies, local government units, civil society organizations, and mining host communities were engaged in those validation and stakeholder consultation. The overall response confirmed the relevance of the assessment result and supported the recommendations that inform the reform of the mining sector in Bangsamoro, which will be uh, presented later by our colleague, Mr. Dats uh, Sankula. Now, as Batek Kita is launching the latest iteration of the report, BK is co-hosting this stakeholder discussion with Menlin IAG today and tomorrow. The initiative is intended or is focused on building the technical and comparative knowledge of the Bangsamoro mining stakeholder as they themselves begin the process of developing uh, the key policy considerations for the new mining code and related fiscal and sector development strategies. So for first day, our focus is tackling the question, what does the future hold for mining in the aftermath of the pandemic? And what are the implications for policy reform to BARM? Tomorrow is an equally interesting topic because our speakers and reactors will tackle the question of uh, uh, how can we have a good, um, mining fiscal policy in BARM and what lessons can we draw from the Philippines and Peru? Uh, it's far too far from, uh, from the Philippines, but uh, tomorrow we can explain why Peru. Um, now, as you can see, uh, we're using a blended approach to participation face-to-face -face and virtual. 
there are some of us in the conference room of IAG, uh, where we, of course, uh, follow safety protocol. While most of you are joining via Zoom, there are many of you who are uh, tuning in via Facebook as this is live stream uh, through the FB accounts of Bante, Kita, and IAG. Now on the close. Our speakers include national, international experts and industry practitioners themselves. We also have a panel of respondents or reactors from the Bangsamoro region who include leaders from BARMS ministries, other executive offices, and the committees in the Bangsamoro Transition Authority, the parliament. We also ensure that there is sufficient room for civil society organizations that work closely with the communities, also the mining companies in Tawi-Tawi and some policy think tank to share their feedback, not only on the discussion, but also the report findings and recommendations. We have three hours for this discussion with a short break, five minute break, and here is the flow of our next session. So next slide, please. Can we go to the next slide for the agenda, uh, the flow? Okay, so um, as you can see, uh, we'll have the opening remark by uh, Director uh, Rafael Remo from Mining and Geosciences Services of MENRE, also our event co-host. Then it will be followed by Mr. Vince Lazatin from Bantequita to introduce the background and the purpose of this discussion. After him is Dato Abdelwin Sankula, who is the former assistant secretary of the DNR and also the project consultant for, for this uh, governance assessment of uh, mining in BARM, who will introduce the highlights from the report. And then it will be followed by panel discussions, which include, which I will introduce more in detail later, uh, from uh, Chamber of Mines Philippines, PHEITI at the Department of Finance, and uh, uh, our colleague from Indonesia. Then a, a quick five minute break. Then we'll continue the discussion through a hearing from the panel of reactors. And we have um, Mr. Jeffrey Balugo from Pax Libera Mining in Tawi-Tawi, Ms. Arlene Sevilla from the Tawi-Tawi Alliance of CSOs. Uh, we are also awaiting uh, the uh, other official from BARM uh, to join us also later. And then after that, we'll have at least 45 minutes uh, for Q&A or open forum, then we'll wrap up. So I think on that note, um, maybe a, a very quick uh, also house rule. So speakers, reactors, and the people who would like to ask, ask questions, feel free to speak both in Tagalog or in English. Uh, as since we have the presence of speakers from Indonesia and other countries. If some of you feel more comfortable using Bisaya or Ilocano, or if you feel more comfortable speaking in any of the Moro dialects, uh, um, let us know. I think we have colleagues here who can help translate if necessary. And uh, for those uh, raising questions, please write them in Zoom chat box. Uh, those who are joining by Zoom, but those who are tuning in by FB, I know there's a, which is this type, you can always uh, write your questions on, on the discussion flow, and then this will be forwarded to me and I will mention your question and your name later. If there's time, we can even ask you to speak to elaborate your points. If you're not speaking, please mute your audio and turn off your video the smooth flow of our discussion in part rests on your consideration of this past. So on that note, I think we are ready. Um, we are now, I would like to call now Director Rafael Remo, who is the uh, Director for the Mines and Geosciences Services Bureau of the MENRE, Ministry of Environment, Natural Resources and Energy to give us the opening remarks. Uh, Mr. Director Remo, it's your turn, please. Thanks. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. 
greetings of peace. The worldwide pandemic has affected each and every one of us in so many ways. It has affected our livelihood, education, our very own way of life. All sectors have been badly hit and we are and we all hope that we have seen the worst. The next thing to do is to move forward. The Ministry of Environment, Natural Resources, and Energy aims to adapt to what this pandemic has brought upon. The Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao has only been in governance since 2019, and policies governing the barms mining industry have still been under the guidance of the national law. And MENRA's mandate to support sustainable development of the region and at the same time protect and conserve the environment is the very reason why formulation of our very own policies to have fiscal autonomy has to be dealt with delicately and with utmost caution. This workshop's objective would aid us to ascertain the future of mining and what we should expect in these trying times. This should help us maneuver ourselves and adjust on what the pandemic has brought upon, what it has been bringing, and what it would bring in relation to the industry that we are in. As we are resilient people, we should also study what has happened before and what lessons we could learn from the past to shape our mining policies to further the development of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao and its constituents. This workshop would also be essential in, in reinforcing our knowledge in application of international standards and best practices in mining. On behalf of our good senior minister and concurrent minister of Menre, Abdul Rauf A. Makakuha, I would like to welcome you all. Good day. Thank you. Thank you, Director Remo, for welcoming the participants. Um, may I now call on Mr. Um, Vince Lazatin, uh, who I believe prepared his video uh, just to mitigate any uh, connection glitch. So uh, uh, Mr. Vince Lazatin is the National Coordinator of Bantay Kita, uh, the lead organizer of this event, and he will introduce what Bantay Kita is, why did they do the, the assessment? Um, at the same time, uh, moving from the report to recommendation and from the recommendation, what is it that the Bantay Kita is hoping to do after this discussion? So uh, let's have a listen to his uh, recorded video. Assalamu alaikum. Good day. I'm Vincent Lezatin, the National Coordinator for Bantai Kita. Bantai Kita is a nationwide coalition of non-government and civil society organizations and academic institutions advocating for transparency and accountability in the extractives industry. The membership is composed of organizations that work in the area of natural resource governance, environmental protection, human, political, civil, and indigenous people's rights, as well as organizations that represent mining affected communities. As an advocate for better natural resource governance, Bantai Kita works with, in several arenas. First is in the area of policy. We work with key policymakers, senators, and congressmen to push for policies and legislation that improve transparency and accountability in the extractive sector. To support evidence-based decision and policymaking, Bantaikita produces research and studies to help inform decision makers. Some of the research includes work on responsible mining, a scoping study on the mining downstream industry, and a study on the local coal industry. Bantaikita has worked with legislators to craft bills on the institutionalization of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative and reforms in the mining fiscal regime. Second, Bantaikita engages in capacity building and training. In order for all stakeholders in the extractive industry to participate meaningfully, they must be capacitated to make informed decisions. Bantaikita regularly conducts trainings and capacity building activities for communities, local government units, government agencies, academe, and other relevant stakeholders. Lastly, Bantaikita is an active member of the multi-stakeholder group of the Philippine Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. 
the EITI, as it, no, as it is known for short, is a global initiative implemented locally to bring greater transparency to the extractive industry. Through its participation in the Philippine EITI, Bantay Kita works with representatives from other civil society organizations, the Philippine government, and the extractive industry to, among other things, ensure that the government and communities are receiving what they should in the form of taxes and royalties from the companies engaged in extractive activities. Recent data have shown that mining the Bangsamoro region has the potential to be an economic driver and significant source of revenue for the government. Taxes, wealth share, and royalties can be an important source of revenue that can fuel the economy and provide fiscal independence for Bangsamoro. At the same time, we know that mining is very controversial and prone to corruption, mismanagement, and is many times the primary cause for irreversible environmental degradation. In order to ensure that the economic benefits are maximized, while at the same time the environment is protected for future generations, good governance in the natural resources sector is an absolute must. It is only through good governance of natural resources that all the competing interests in the mining industry can be balanced. Without the burden of legacy legislation and institutions, the Bangsamoro stands with a blank sheet of paper upon which it can write the laws, create the institutions, and develop a framework where the greatest benefits will redound to the greatest number of people in a sustainable fashion. As part of its public policy interventions and capacity building efforts, and through a USAID funded project called Deepening Access, Transparency and Accountability to Improve Natural Resource Governance and Empower Communities, or Project Data for short, Bantai Kita is working with the Ministry of Environment, Natural Resources and Energy and the Institute of Autonomy and Governance to conduct this two-day multi-stakeholder discussion entitled Envisioning Good Governance and Fiscal Policy of Mining in the Bangsamoro Region. The overall purpose of this two-day discussion is to help build the technical and comparative knowledge of the Bangsamoro stakeholders. The Bangsamoro is in a critical stage in its development as it starts to craft laws and policies regarding the mining sector. This is of utmost importance as it begins to consider the relationship between a revenue system and the broader development strategy. The first day will focus on the impact of COVID-19 on the mining industry and how this may affect mining in the Barm region and what reform measures it should undertake. This discussion is highly relevant for the development of a mining code and associated fiscal and sector development strategies. The second day will then take a look at mining fiscal policy for sustainable development and draw lessons from both the Philippines and Peru. Looking at these two cases will hopefully be instructional to all BARM stakeholders as you consider the role of mining and its impacts in the context of sustainable development. I hope this short background will put you all in the right frame of mind for the next two days as we tackle some very important matters that will determine the future of mining and the extractive industry in BARM. But Daikita stands ready to work with government, industry, communities, the academe, and other relevant stakeholders in ensuring natural resource governance that is beneficial to the greatest number of people and one that looks towards a sustainable future for Bangsamoro. We are very happy to be working with MENRE and IAG during this very exciting time. Most especially, we hope to contribute our experience and expertise to BARM as it works towards sustainable mining policies that draws lessons from our past to create a brighter future for the people of Bangsamoro. Thank you and let us have a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. Um, and uh, that's a very good uh, background uh, or, or context uh, to set this discussion. And the, he mentioned about the report uh, since while the speakers and other participants have already read hopefully the report, there may be new in the audience who are not aware that there was a report, a 74 page report 
that was done in 2018 until 2019 and then presented for validation last year, which actually underpins this uh, discussion. So um, we are happy to share that report with you as requested. And the highlights of the report will later be presented by our colleague here. But maybe just to give you a flavor of what's in the study, uh, how was it done, who conducted it, there's actually a very short three minute video that explain um, how the report was done, it's what's in it. So uh, if we could flash on screen the, the video, please. Thanks. All right, so that uh, captures uh, how the, re the study was done. And that's why we have the report that then informs this study. Very quickly, to some of you who may not be familiar with the assessment framework that was done here, if you could flash on screen and the framework. Uh, very quickly, uh, the study used the so-called natural resource uh, charter, which is a, a, an assessment framework, which has been used in more than 30 resource-rich countries from uh, parts of Indonesia to Myanmar to Mongolia, uh, as well as in Africa and other uh, mining-rich countries in the world, where there had been some interest from governments, uh, academic civil society, to have a much in-depth look uh, basically to do a benchmarking in diagnostics about what areas in their mining oil and gas need to be better understood and what needs to be strengthened. 
So the Natural Resource Charter Framework was developed by a think tank organization. It's called Natural Resource Governance Institute Disclosure. I used to be the director for Asia Pacific of NRGI. And so we have the experience using this in, 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 in other countries. And so we tried applying this framework uh, in the context of Bangsamoro Autonomous Regional Government, where in, in some cases, the finding from the report has been used to inform the necessary uh, change in the mining or specific aspects of, of the industry. Sometimes it could lead to further research. Some of this could lead to some institutional strengthening initiative uh, or could find further study. So it could lead to either institutional decisions or policy reform measures. So what you can see on the screen is the Natural Resource Charter actually look at the so-called the decision chain of mining that is from the domestic foundation. We're looking at, we, we, we did the study, uh, we're looking at the regulatory framework, the institutional uh, strategy, capacity, uh, the, um, the disclosure, the civil society participation of, of, of mining. And then we also look at the so-called the decision to extract. We look at how are the exploration and license licenses being allocated, what process was used uh, during the arm uh, period. Um, and then we, we look at those into technical details. We also look at the taxation. Basically, we look at the fiscal regime of mining, the taxes that were imposed and other revenues imposed for mining operation. We also look at the getting a good deal. Basically, we look at the how communities and local governments were benefiting from their share of the revenue uh, payments from the companies and how they were actually shared. Um, there's no government owned and controlled corporation or state of enterprise in 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 Myanmar in sorry in Bangsamoro compared with other countries. So we skip that. But we also look at the way the mining proceeds, uh, the revenues from mining were being managed. So we look at the revenue distribution, the revenue sharing, how the shares uh, by the local government were incorporated, if any, in the local development plan, and how the royalty or share uh, that accrued to the communities were were allocated and how would this actually be used? Uh, and also we know that uh, uh, there's also a fund for social development, management, environmental spending. We also look into that. Uh, we also look at the link between the use of uh, mining revenue with the implementation of the regional uh, and local development plans or strategies. Um, we also look at some of the standards used by the mining companies and how uh, the international standards have actually been applied to mining operations in, in, uh, in, in the Bangsamoro mining uh, sector. So that's what we refer to by natural resource charter. There were several questions that were asked and we benchmarked that against some of those uh, places. And we paid attention to the Tawi-Tawi, because that is where most, if not all, of the current mining operations in Bangsamoro region uh, are allocated and active. No? So, so that's, in a nutshell, the Natural Resource Charter. Now, I would like to call uh, my colleague, um, Dato Abdelwin Sankula, um, who is the former Assistant Secretary of the DNR ARM, and who's also our uh, co-project consultant uh, for this, to give us highlights from the report, basically the key takeaways in terms of key findings, as well as the policy options for consideration by the barn mining stakeholders. So over to you, uh, Mr. Uh, that's San uh, Abdelwin Sankula. Okay, um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mr. Jalason Garcia. Um, Assalamu alaikum and fresh morning to everyone gathered here, either physically or via Zoom. 
Before I proceed to present our key findings on BAM's mining governance study, I beg your indulgence by allowing me to just quickly state the following scope and uh, limitations of this study. Uh, one, this study was conducted during the time of ARM in the early part of BARM's transition from July 2018 to June 2019. Secondly, we only focus on mining, especially the meta metallic minerals and other resources, for example, like uh, oil and gas, petroleum, and among others, um, which are also part of our mineral resources, were not part of the study uh, due to limited time frame and resources. And third, the fiscal data, such as the uh, growth to 2021 were not part of the overall assessment. So that's the uh, scope and limitations of our study. Now, what are the uh, key findings of the 70-page report? One major findings is one, next slide, please. There are deficits in BARM's mining governance, no? And what are these um, deficits? One is the legal framework is not robust. If I can recall it right, the legal framework then was only based on Republic Act 7942 or the Philippine Mining Act of 1995. And the attempt of the Regional Legislative Assembly, RLA arm, to pass a new law on mining did not gain traction and has never been implemented because it simply modeled uh, the Philippine Mining Act of uh, 1995. But the good news is the Bangsamoro Organic Law guarantees the highest form of uh, autonomy to the Bangsamoro government, uh, which includes, of course, the decentralization of uh, fiscal authority. Second, the data, next slide, there is hardly any open and comprehensive resource data. Uh, the data that we have in the region then and now are not that comprehensive and uh, open. During my time as the OIC of the MGS, the Mines and Geoscience section, our data was more of a compilation of the existing MPSA and the mining feasibility studies of the mining companies. Um, for example, um, uh, the question here is what is the extent of the mineral endowments if, uh, of the region. We don't have that comprehensive data. Only the estimated volume of extractable minerals uh, covered by the existing MPSAs with active and non-operating activities was accessed during the research. And when we say deficits, we are not only referring to the geological, contractual, and feasibility information, but also on the accuracy of mining reports on fiscal payments, environmental management, as well as on social development spending. Third, next slide, next, okay. Uh, mining activities fall short of minimum safeguards standards, no? Uh, the ongoing mining operations in the administration of the industry do not suggest that the Bangsamoro demonstrate competency to manage environmental risk, resource-based conflicts, interagency coordination on monitoring and oversight, and to utilize mining revenues into a long-term development investments. So those are the three um, bases when we say that there are deficits in mining governance. Next slide, please. driver. Uh, the basis for this conclusion are based on the following. One, mining and quarrying combined are not the most significant sources of uh, revenue. If you look at the, uh, at, at the, general, at the general value added vis-a-vis -vis to, to the uh, gross regional domestic product in 2017, it was only 0.44 percent, no? It's far below the national average of 0.65%, uh, which is also insignificant. Um, and although ARM posted a 7.3% growth rate in 2017, since 2000, from 2016, 
uh, and a little bit higher than the national performance of 6.7%. However, mining makes a relatively small contribution to the regional economy. Second, next, the volume of production, mostly nickel, is yet to scale as companies with active operations are rather limited. The volume of production is yet to scale, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you can see that the production is just recent, no, since the mining exploration extraction only started in 2012, following the granting of the MPSAs. No? So during our time, when I was with the DNRR, our data on the measured and uh, identified mineral resources are at 18.5 million wet metric tons, metric tons, with a minimum of 9.9 .9 million wet metric tons mineable reserve. But these are work taken from the mining feasibility studies of the mining companies and not an independent one. When we say measured mineral resources, we are referring to the estimates on the quantity, the grade or quality, the densities, the shape and the physical characteristics of mineral resources, particularly nickel. Third, last but not the least, uh, mining, next slide please, is far from being a major generator of stable jobs and associated livelihoods. Um, the 2017 Philippine EITA report um, shows that about 3,000 workers are directly employed by mining and quarrying activities in the region, which has been the same estimate since 2014. However, since no mining companies from the region participated in the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, there is no data uh, to break down, uh, that breaks down rather on how many are regularly employed um, versus those under contractual terms, how many percent are female and how many are local uh, hires uh, as opposed to the migrant workers. So uh, these are the three um, major findings, uh, key findings on why mining is not yet a, a, a growth driver. Now, based on these findings, what are the next slide, please? What are the policy considerations, options? Uh, one is we need to prioritize the development of a robust mining code, no? Uh, of course, when we say a robust, it should have an implementing rules that are clear, functional, and well-resourced, well-resourced to realize policy objectives. It should be based on meaningful consultations and well-informed deliberations. And it should be, of course, guided by the BL provisions which articulates the, and, and also articulates the long-term policy objective with actionable uh, policy provisions. It specifically, uh, it should, for example, adopt a strong environmental and social management system. So meaning the EAA framework is not uh, sufficient enough uh, for, for that. Um, and also we need an efficient disclosure rules for MPSA, especially in exploration, production, and disclosure of mines. We also need to consider the uh, and creating the Bank Samoro mining enterprise or state-owned enterprise, among others. No. Second, um, uh, on the on the meaningful consultations uh, or the well-informed. Uh, go ahead. On the second is on the there must be well-informed institutional strategy and competent implementing agencies, especially uh, Mendre. No. Um, so one of these is uh, uh, it should be supported by a sound implementation roadmap, adequate and competent human resources, sufficient budget and functioning MIS, and then effective implementation in intergovernmental bodies and strategic partnership with non-actors and expert institutions. Just to give you some example in terms of um, uh, on the number one need on the, on the competent human resources, we really need to invest in upgrading the competencies of technical staff of the ministry. Uh, continue, of course, uh, for example, and another one is continue enforcing um, the imposition of moratorium um, or issuing new mining production sharing agreement or MPSAs until a new mining code is enacted. Um, 
Another one is on the sufficiency on, on, on budget and functioning monitoring information system. Um, one is we need to ensure that the Environmental Management Bureau is efficient and effective in performing the oversight role of the environmental and social management systems. And on the effective participation, uh, there is a need to, uh, to engage uh, or participate in the extractive industry initiative. So those are the, fun, for those are the findings and policy options that Bante Kita and other stakeholders are proposing. And we do hope that the Bangsamor government would uh, seriously consider. Thank you and uh, wassalam. Thank you, uh, Guts. Uh, Asek uh, Sankula. Um, and basically, what you highlighted there is twofold. One is policy reform, a new law, a robust uh, mining code. Second is the institutional strengthening. Um, just to note that what you presented there is just the first part of the key findings and the recommendations. Tomorrow, we will give, uh, we'll have a more in-depth uh, presentation and discussion about the key findings on the fiscal side of bar mining and also the uh, policy options uh, uh, for consideration on how the mining, uh, mining industry along with the mining code will also have a uh, uh, adapt uh, good fiscal policy. We were talking about taxation, also the revenue uh, sharing uh, mechanism uh, for, for mining and, and how that is linked with the broader fiscal autonomy and sustainable development strategy of Bangsamoro because these are all enshrined in the Bangsamoro organic law. So as you can sense, uh, our conversation around mining in Bangsamoro is under the framework of the Bangsamoro organic law. So just for everyone to know uh, so that we are on the same page about, you know, where do we actually start with, with the locate the discussion here? All right. So on that note, uh, I think that's a very good start to really give the background. We would like to hear now uh, from the mining companies themselves, um, uh, represented by the executive director, attorney Ronald Residoro, um, who is the executive director of Chamber of Mines. And earlier, I gave him uh, some uh, questions that hopefully uh, would provide some parameters of his presentation because I know that he has a lot to say. Uh, but since we are locating this conversation around the impacts of the COVID-19 health crisis, uh, question for him is how does that impact, if any, uh, the company members of, of, of Chamber of Mines in terms of the revenue projection, the safeguards of employed workers, the fiscal, social, and environmental obligations. Uh, I know that he's going to give us a, a quick review of what are the essential components of the Philippine Mining uh, Act and, and how he does relate that to his presentation. Uh, also, I think it's also important to ask uh, how do companies maintain their resilience at this time, trying times while upholding their commitments not to a responsible and sustainable uh, mining? And what are the governance reform implications of mining based on the Chamber's experience before and during the pandemic? So from the Chamber of Mines perspective, what lessons would he share uh, with the BARM region? Uh, that that uh, I heard before from uh, Director Remo that the development of mining code is one of the top priorities of the leadership. Uh, so, the, so I think that's, that's very important to hear. So what would he uh, consider to be the important message uh, that he would like to impart to BARM leadership around policy reform on, on mining? Uh, with the view that there is still accountability while maintaining sustainable development benefits for their citizens. So over to you, Attorney Residor. Good morning. Thank you, Jelson, and good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, this morning, I have been asked to speak on the challenges we face as stakeholders 
to ensure accountability and sustainable development in the extractive sector with particular focus on the Bangsamoro. This discussion is not only good, but necessary for the Bangsamoro Autonomous Government as it seeks to chart a way forward for its people. Mining has been identified as a key economic driver for the Bangsamoro and for good reason. The region, though largely unexplored, indicates significant potential for gold, nickel, chromite, iron, and manganese. And these are only the territorial resources. There may be even bigger mineral and energy resources offshore or in the sea. But with this potential comes inherent environmental and social risks of mining, which if not addressed at the outset, could damage the land and its people and ultimately leave the Bangsamoro people worse off than when they started. I say this because mining can cause some of the most dramatic impacts on the natural environment and human health. The footprint of mining operations is large, often visible from outer space, with large excavations standing out like a scar on the face of the earth. Mining impacts air, water, and land so significantly that the sector is often blamed for any and all environmental disasters that occur within their vicinity. Now, while the environmental damage from mining can indeed be mitigated and the mined out area rehabilitated to become productive farm or agroforestry land, such transformation will require consistent governance and expert regulation. The challenge is therefore how to balance the need for revenues with the heavy toll exacted by mining in a way that would benefit the people of the Bangsamoro. For the national government, this balancing is done through RA7942 or the Philippine Mining Act of 1995. This nearly three decades old law was crafted in 95 in response to the demands of a changing time. At that time, the Mining Act was a great leap forward for the country because it mandated that companies set aside funds for environmental protection and social development of their host and neighboring communities. No other country in the world had dared make these funds mandatory. Now, uh, the Philippine Mining Act provides a good template from which the Bangsamoro government can pattern their own mining law. It incorporates forward-looking provisions that anticipate for our future needs, as well as regulation to ensure that mining is done only by qualified contractors in areas declared open to mining. I would therefore suggest that uh, the Bangsamoro government consider the following key features of the Mining Act. One, it enumerates areas close to mining applications where mining cannot and should never take place, such as government reservations, archaeological and historical sites, old growth forests, and proclaimed watersheds. To this list, EO79 has added night pass protected areas, prime agricultural land, and tourism development areas. Secondly, the Mining Act enumerates three types of mineral agreements that government could enter into with contractors, MPSAs, co-production sharing agreements, and joint ventures, each one with its own distinct advantage and disadvantage. Third, it lists minimum financial and technical qualifications needed before an applicant can be considered as a mining contractor and undertake mining activities on behalf of the state. Fourth, it sets forth maximum areas allowed to be explored, developed, and mined. With mandatory relinquishment, once an area is determined to be free of commercially viable ore deposits. Next, it mandates that contractors prepare and set aside funds for environmental protection and enhancement programs. Six, it requires contractors to conduct an environmental impact assessment as an integral part of securing an environmental clearance certificate. Next, it institutionalizes an environmental guarantee fund to ensure just and timely compensation for damage and progressive and sustainable rehabilitation for any adverse effect a mining operation may cause. 
Eight, for projects located within ancestral domains, it requires contractors to first secure the free prior and informed consent of indigenous peoples holding title to the area and mandates a minimum royalty of at least 1% of gross output. It also requires contractors to secure the positive endorsement of major Sangunians concerned before commencement of any development and or mining activities. And finally, it requires contractors to prepare and fund a social development and management program to ensure the sustained improvement of communities by creating responsible, self-reliant communities capable of managing their own development. These, I believe, should be the mere, bare minimum provisions that a good mining regulatory law should contain. And the Mining Act, as I have just outlined, is indeed good law. However, 25 years after the passage of the Mining Act, and looking at the lived experience of impacted communities, we see that mining communities that prosper are few, especially in the more remote areas. We see weak resource governance at all levels as a key stumbling block to achieving sustainable development. This is something that the Bangsamoro Autonomous Government must also focus on and address. Sustainability enhancing resource governance institutions are weak or non-existent. Sustainability strategies are often developed from the top down with little or no involvement of sustainability scientists. While the current MGB of the national government has done a lot to improve SDMP planning, many mining companies are still trapped by complacency or an attitude of basic compliance and encouraged by a regulatory structure that is undermanned and underfunded. Impact communities themselves are no better. Many do not have the capacity to determine what they really need. So many end up asking for a lot of expensive infrastructure or livelihood programs that they do not really need or do not have the capacity to sustain. Secondly, mechanisms to ensure transparency, not just in how mining companies plan to protect the environment, but also in the use and distribution of money generated by mining are also often weak as are arrangements for transforming this wealth into human development and environmental quality. The lack of transparency leads to misinformation, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and therefore conflict. Development strategies are disjointed, siloed, duplicative, and very often lack synergy. Many are barely compliant with little thought or foresight into, into their conceptualization and planning. Many are trite and rely repeatedly on easy formulas that show lackadaisical uh, result. Third, the absence of a larger long-term national mineral strategy or roadmap that takes into account not just contributions to the economy, but the development of impacted communities and the protection of the environment as well. Without such a long-term national policy, we see sporadic minerals development, often in conflict with local development strategies, and worse, flip-flopping from our elected leaders, whether or not we should push ahead with money. To ensure sustainability, therefore, the, Bans the Bangsamoro government must strengthen its resource governance mechanism. To do that, it must address three areas of concern. Number one, mining's economic contribution. Number two, the community's social development. And number three, the protection and enhancement of the government. Addressing all these will greatly enhance the sustainability of mining in the Bangsamoro. To all the previous enumerations, therefore, I would add, like, next slide, please. First, that you consider a progressive fiscal regime that is attractive to mining investors, while at the same time allowing your government a windfall share when commodity prices are high. Secondly, a transparent and publicly available registry of mineral agreements that are issued by the Bangsamoro Autonomous Government. Third, strong government oversight 
over a contractor's mining operations to ensure compliance with environmental protection regulations and prevent speculation through a firm and consistent use it or lose it policy. Fourth, consider widening the impact of SDMP by including development projects for the entire municipality or province and not just the impacted host or neighboring communities. Fifth and lastly, consider the development of a medium scale mining framework with less capitalization required. This will encourage the entry and participation of smaller local capital into mining and allow you to take uh, to, to extract smaller deposits that would otherwise be unattractive to larger players and is left stranded on the ground. Now, before I close, I would like to share with you one timely and relevant way to show the benefits of mining in the ongoing fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. In March of 2020, the Mines and Geosciences Bureau issued a memorandum authorizing all its regional offices to allow mining companies to realign unutilized SDMP funds to support affected impact communities during the implementation of the enhanced community quarantine due to COVID-19. Now, because of this timely action by the MGB, next slide please. As of August 7, 2020, a total of 407 million uh, SDMP budget have been realigned by mining companies. Out of this budget, a total 380 million was utilized to procure um, protective equipment and medical supplies, and to purchase goods and supplies for social amelioration measures. This has benefited nearly 300,000 individual frontliners and over a million households and families. In the next slides, I'd like to show you some examples of how exactly mining companies uh, helped through their SDMP. Here we see uh, various companies uh, purchasing disinfectant, medicine, and protective equipment to help their local communities. Next slide. And here we see uh, not just medicines and PPE, but also food supplies and basic necessities were distributed to host communities that were then in lockdown in early 2020. Now, if there is anything that the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has taught us in the mining industry, it is that mining companies and their host communities are best able to respond to this crisis compared to other sectors or industries like manufacturing, agriculture, or tourism. Given the compact and relatively remote environment that mines operate in, mining operations can and did continue to operate even in the worst of the pandemic. Extreme lockdowns and social distancing protocols were put in place, but on the whole, mining companies continue to safely operate, earning for the government much needed export revenues that helped fund the overall national effort to fight the pandemic. More importantly, mining companies were able to mobilize already available social development and management program funds and company resources to provide much needed medical help to their host communities. Next slide. Today, uh, I'm sorry, okay, I trust me, Lisa. Today, miners are coming to realize the inherent benefits of working towards sustainability. Sustainability can improve operational efficiency and lead to both short and long-term benefits. It can give companies a social license to operate and the possibility of leaving behind a positive social and environmental legacy. Sustainability starts by engaging with the community and aspiring to deliver positive community and social outcomes, thereby enhancing both current and future human needs. Both the government and industry need to take a comprehensive view of sustainable development and cover dimensions other than the natural environment, such as community development and health, innovation and infrastructure strengthening resource governance mechanisms and competitiveness. An informed and involved community reduces social friction, 
It can improve profit sharing and increase operational efficiency. Threats can be easily identified and addressed before they erupt into social and environmental catastrophes. Science and research will also be critical in ensuring sustainability. It is not enough that we take a scientific or technical approach to mining. It must also be a social science approach. Clearly, resource governance that allows, social, uh, that allows local participation is more likely to succeed than institutions imposed from the outside. A sustainable mine is more likely to be profitable when it has improved transparency and operational efficiency net of its own reserves and global commodities prices. That ends my presentation for this morning. I hope I was able to impart something of value to do today. Thank you and good day. Thank you, Attorney uh, Risid Doro. I think your message is loud and clear. I think there are, I think the policy propositions for considerations are quite clear when you highlighted the nine important features of the mining law while understanding that there are still some uh, areas there, provisions that need to be corrected or improved. I think some of the key takeaway from your presentation is, actually the message is, uh, there's some alignment, I would say, in what you said about the importance of progressive taxation to consider, uh, the participation of Bangsa Moro government with the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, where the Philippines has been not just an active member, but has been one of the, the you know, compliant countries when it comes to its EITI commitments. Also, um, the importance of, this is somewhere where I personally I align with you on the uh, importance of a strong government oversight over the contractor with regard, with respect to their compliance to the environmental, social, and legal obligations, because that's very important to mining sustainability as well. Uh, and also you emphasize about linking the use of the SMDP, not just uh, with the needs of the project affected community, but linking that with the medium term or broader development strategy of the host municipality. And I think it should also apply not just in the context of, of, of the municipality. I think it should also be part of the, should be part of the narrative consideration for the uh, regional development strategy. I was just speaking actually this morning with the D Director General of the Bangsamoro Planning and Development Agency. And uh, he rightly pointed that certainly we need to incorporate mining within the, the framework of the Bangsamoro Sustainable Development uh, Plan, which they are currently actually reviewing the implementation of that uh, until 2022. And they will be pre preparing for the 2023 to 2028 Bangsamoro Development Strategy. So it would be, uh, uh, interesting to see how that mining is uh, located within that broader strategy. All right, um, and and thanks also for letting us uh, uh, aware, uh, making us aware about how the uh, um, the COVID response of the mining company is uh, in part also a function of the directive from the from the from the DNR, the Minerja Census Bureau, to allocate 1.5% of your operating costs to respond to uh, COVID, especially those families that are in need of medical and other uh, immediate uh, support services. So I think, uh, please stay there because I think there will be some question that will come your way later. But before I call the next uh, speaker, uh, I just want to highlight that, that there were more than 60 uh, registration, uh, those people who registered in Zoom, uh, namely more than uh, uh, 40 civil society organizations and others coming from Bangsamoro, Philippines and outside as well. And we have 25 registration from the Bangsamoro leadership, meaning the BTA and the executives. And so far, I've been told that there were currently there are more than 60 people who are joining us by viewing us via Facebook. So I hope that we could also get questions from them later. I also would like to mention specific uh, 
uh, offices of the Bangsamoro Transition Authority in leadership uh, because they are well represented here, including a member of parliament, uh, uh, Sultan Makakua Loong, uh, MP Salindo, MP UEK uh, Simo Baintan, and Lidasan. And I see that there is also a full force participation from the Philippine EITI, and also uh, all the directors and many staff from the Ministry of Environment, Natural Resources, and uh, Energy. So that's that's good. So uh, we would like to hear from you also. Please write your questions on chat uh, so that we will uh, mention them later. All right. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Mr. Eastwood Eastward Manlises, who is the National Coordinator of the PHEITI, a uh, house uh, within the Department of Finance. And so, Mr. Manlises, uh, I wondered if you could uh, give us uh, some view about how COVID-19 health crisis has been affecting mining market and mining operations in the Philippines, although we've been given some preview of that by Attorney Risidoro. But how does that impact, if any, the Philippine company's revenue projections and fiscal obligation? And from the fiscal management perspective, what important lesson do you think would you share with the Bangsamoro leadership that is seeking to uh, improve its mining policy, improve its institutional capacity and practices uh, uh, to ensure accountability and sustainable development of mining benefits their citizens. So over to you, Mr. Manises. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jelson. And I hope my uh, audio is uh, clear. Um, yes. at at the onset, I apologize for the ambient noise that might come uh, in occasionally. I'm currently working from home. But anyway, um, honorable members of the Bangsamoro Transition Authority and uh, the Bangsamoro Parliament, Director Rafael Remo of the um, Bar Mendre MGB, and Asik Sankula, guests, friends, assalamu alaikum, good morning. On behalf of my principals, Department of Finance Under Secretary Bayani Agabi and Assistant Secretary Valerie Joy Bayon, I thank the Bantaykita Published Watipi Philippines, the Bar Mendre, the IAG and the USAID for inviting the DOF to this multi-stakeholder discussion. Um, the invitation uh, is uh, actually um, sent to the Office of Assistant uh, Secretary Brion, but uh, she is currently attending an equally important engagement, so the task was delegated to me. Um, I also would like to acknowledge the members of the Philippine EITA MSG who are here. Um, of course, uh, uh, Sir Vince, the National Coordinator of Bantaykita, um, and Attorney Ron, the previous speaker, is also an MSG member, Professor Lady Limangada, and also the members of the PHEITI Secretariat. Um, I also see some former members of the uh, MSG, Sina Mamtes Abada, and I think Attorney Jay Batong Bakal. Hindi ko na siya naabutan, pero if I, got, if I remember correctly, he's also an MSG member before. Um, all right, so I, uh, we, we congratulate PK for the publication of this uh, new study. And uh, we note how EITI uh, country reports and publications are well cited in, in this report um, with two actionable policy options uh, being mentioned. Uh, two, policy, two, two actionable policy options mentioning or directly pertaining to EITI. One yung 1.9 adoption of anti-corruption and tax avoidance measures in mining decision chain. And then yung 2.4 participation in the EITI. So we welcome those uh, recommendations. I we really hope that uh, the Bangsamoro government will consider those uh, recommendations or um, actionable actionable policy um, options. And uh, I also understand that tomorrow, Attorney Brenda J. Mendoza of the EITI International, the country manager for Asia, will be discussing EITI. But for the benefit who will be uh, attending only today, um, I, I I will give a, a, a brief overview of what uh, EITI is, is and what are the basis for implementation in the Philippines and also um, and by the previous engagement on PHEITI with the uh, Bangsamoro uh, region. Um, so EITI is uh, the global standard for the open, accountable, and good governance of the mining oil gas uh, sector. In our case, we also cover the coal industry. So what we do is uh, three pillars. 
number one is uh, the creation of, of a multi-stakeholder group. This multi-stakeholder group um, sets the terms and direction of the IT implementation in the country, and they also decide on what information will be contained in uh, the annual country report. So the second pillar is the publication of the annual country report. It contains uh, one contextual information on uh, uh, on, on the mining industry and the oil and gas and coal industries. Um, kasama dito yung legal framework, updates on any laws that uh, govern the, the sector, also um, economic data, um, data on exports, data on uh, on on uh, production. And then yung pinakamalaking part ng uh, publication is the reconciliation of revenue data. revenue Government revenue collection, also government revenue um, distribution and management. And then some uh, some other information like uh, information on contracts, information on beneficial ownership uh, of companies. So we we put everything in one report and then we publish it annually. Um, so far we have uh, produced seven reports and they are all publicly accessible uh, at the PHE ITI website. So that's the second pillar. Uh, again, the first pillar MSG uh, creation of the MSG and then the publication of the annual report. And then the third pillar is the communication of this report to the public um, to inform public debate, to encourage um, uh, uh, discussion, uh, especially on policy recommendations based on data. Um, we, we promote data-informed uh, governance in, in the EIPI. So basically, that's what we do. There are seven requirements, but I think Attorney Bisi will discuss that tomorrow. Now, the um, basis for implementation in the Philippines, um, dalawa lang naman, the EO 79 series of 2012, where the Philippine government uh, first committed to implement the EITI. And may I just mention that in July this year, the, the EO will be turning uh, 10 years. So it might be uh, uh, of interest to the participants here to look into the provisions of that uh, EO. Uh, ano na ba yung nagawa after 10 years? Um, section 14 dun yung EITI. And then the other um, EO is EO... Uh, one for seven years of 2013. So after EO 79 was issued in 2012, the following year, the Philippine MSG and the Secretariat was uh, uh, formally created. And now we are lodged at the Department of Finance. Uh, now, may correction din ako ng konti dun sa, hindi ko alam kung nakuha ko ng tama or baka it's pertaining to um, to, to the BARM, uh, to, 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 to the Bank Samoa region. But on, I think on page 51, it, it said there, uh, the report, that uh, um, participation in the EITI is voluntary. So um, for for the most part of the country, maybe not part, hindi kasama yung BARM kasi nga uh, may, may autonomy to, to adopt uh, its own position on certain policies. But for the most part of the country, mandatory para sa mining contractors ang participation in the EITI by virtue of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources now Administrative or uh, Department of Administrative Order 2017-07. So mandatory siya for mining contractors that that covers metallic and non-metallic uh, companies. And uh, pero tama naman na uh, voluntary pa rin siya for oil and gas and coal because uh, wala pang uh, similar uh, measure na nire-release ng DOE um, pagdating sa participation ng oil and oil, gas and coal companies sa EITI. So naalala ko lang bigla. Uh, now, uh, um, this this uh, multi stakeholder discussion is uh, a good start uh, to encourage our uh, colleagues or our friends at the Bank Samora government to uh, at at this point already consider the implementation of the ITI or maybe the EITI principles um, in their government. Uh, I understand that uh, the the region has yet to um, uh, pass the develop and pass a mining code. And uh, it might be good to already uh, consider uh, EITI principles in the development of uh, of this mining code, particularly uh, and not just in the mining code. Maybe if not in the mining code, maybe in the revenue code or other appropriate legislation. Um, actually, there are opportunities for sub subnationalization here and also systematic disclosure. These are two jargons that we use in the EITI, and maybe Attorney BJ will be discussing that tomorrow. Uh, but uh, yeah, we hope we look forward to uh, working with the Baksamora government on this uh, on these items. Um, and uh, may I just uh, share uh, with you also that the uh, BARM engagement um, is included in the work plan of the MSG for this year. Um, it's one of the priorities. So just a quick overview of what we have been doing, uh, how, how we are engaging the Baksamora government over the years. Um, 
since 20, since 2015 to 2018, uh, we've been trying to engage the the then ARMM. Uh, we invite them to our subnational forums, and even in the country reports we publish, uh, we include um, uh, oh, an overview of the extractive industries in the ARMM, uh, particularly in the fiscal year 2015, 2016, 2017, uh, the HEITI country reports. And then in 2016, we uh, included in the annexes of the report uh, the study conducted by uh, AFRIM or the Alternate Forum for Research in Mindanao. It's called the Extractive Industry Governance in the Mangsamoro, a question of risks and benefits. So the, the study of BK uh, it, this November uh, 2021 is a good follow up or follow through. Parang kasunod nitong study na to. Uh, mas updated yun sa BK. But as early as 2016, we already have uh, uh, a scoping study um, in the ARM, in the then ARMM. Um, and then uh, um, yung, yung, yung BARM engagement, it's also a recommendation of the 2017 EITI validation. The recommendation is to continuously engage BARM uh, precisely because we are, no mining company in BARM is, wala, wala pang mining company sa BARM ang nag-report sa PHEITI. May uh, konting reluctance. But hopefully, with, with, the new, with this new um, engagements and initiatives, uh, masimula na natin to kahit one company, company lang for this year. And then in August 2021, that was just last year, uh, we uh, renewed uh, some discussions with the uh, Bar Mendre. And I remember uh, Director uh, uh, Remo participating in, in one of that, uh, in, in that meeting. So na orienta namin sila ng konti about the ITI. Um, sana magtuli tuloy yun this year. Uh, so, um, let's go to the questions. I, I was given uh, two questions. Um, una muna yung uh, um, the impact of COVID-19 on on the mining industry. And um, I think I've said that some ni attorney Ron, but uh, basically, uh, hindi severe. I would say hindi severe impact, at least for the metallic mining sector. Um, the uh, the PHEITI just published um, its seventh report, and that seventh report includes a chapter on industry outlook. Uh, that's chapter three. Again, you can check that on our website. And that that outlook, uh, that industry outlook, um, notes that the metallic mining sector has been relatively resilient to the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, maybe because uh, as early as May 5, 2020, the Department of Trade and Industry under Memorandum Circular 20-22 immediately classified the oil, gas, and coal metallic mining, non-metallic mining, SSM sectors as essential establishments. So unlike other uh, uh, establishments, uh, the, the mining sector was able to uh, continue its operations despite movement and safety restrictions in many areas of the country. So again, hindi siya masyadong na-apektuhan. May, may counting effect, may closure for a few months, but um, uh, I think second quarter yung nag-ooperate na ulit. Uh, at you can correct me on that. Nag-ooperate na ulit uh, most mining companies. And uh, in an article published by SNP Global Market Intelligence, uh, the Chamber of Mines uh, of the Philippines said that the impact of COVID-19 to the metallic industry, again, is not severe. So it uh, it came directly for the, from the Chamber of Mines. Uh, I think si Sir Jerry Dimo yung na-quote dito. And then, um, kanina nagpakita ng uh, data si uh, at Tony Roy, medyo magkaiba kami ng data pero magkalapit naman. Um, the DNR on July 25 to the 20 said that uh, the sector uh, was able to support or complement the pandemic response of the government with a total of 402 million relief relief funds from realigned unspent 2019 social development and management program funds. The pandemic response of the mining industry has so far benefited more than 1.4 million households and frontliners in mining post enabled communities across the country. So um, it not just it's not just the mining company being resilient to the impacts of the of the of the pandemic, but um, it was uh, capable of supporting the government's pandemic response. Lalo na nandun sila sa area. Directly sila nakakapag-communicate with the community. They know who are affected. They can provide readily provide the um, assistance needed by the frontliners and also by um, the host communities. And um, realizing the resilience of the industry and its capacity to complement government initiatives uh, in crisis like this, um, the government through EO 130 series of 2021 lifted the nine-year moratorium on new mineral agreements that EO 79 uh, enforced. So open na ngayon tayo sa panibago mga mineral agreements, pero wala pa naman yata bago talaga na-approve recently kasi tinapos pa yung uh, 
uh, IRR, pero may mga ano namin mga ina-assess ng mga applications. And then um, based on reconciled PHEITI data, um, we also would like to share that uh, the average um, collection of provinces at post-metallic mines is 41.2 million from fiscal years 2016 to 2020. So ganun kalaki yung uh, nakokollect ng mga LGUs hosting metallic mines on the average uh, from 2016 to 2020. And then sa SDMP expenditure naman per LGU in the same period, um, pwedeng nakakapag-contribute ang mga companies ng, uh, nak- nagbe-benefit ang, L- ang LGUs ng about, about or around 70.6 million peso. So itong mga amounts na to, uh, LGUs like BARM, Can, can tap these uh, revenues and social expenditures to support calamity response and sustainable local development. So it, meron, meron naman siyang direct benefit talaga na mabibigay. Although I, I note that, uh, that, uh, um, that the report, uh, the BK report, uh, high, highlighted nga na uh, hindi pa masyadong mataas ang contribution. It cannot, hindi pa siya pwede makonsider na major driver of the economy. But one question is, gusto ba natin maging major driver ng local economy, yung mining industry. Parang that, that's a question that we should also ask. Uh, does the community, do the local government units, or does the Bangsa Motor government want want this to be a major driver of the of the economy? Pe, parang nabanggit din sa report na it's one of the 12 na pag, uh, pagkukunan. So maybe that answer that already answers the question. And if it if it uh, if it is one of the major drivers, Um, may mga actions kaya na kailangan gawin para matulungan yung industry to be more sustainable, more robust, um, magsisimula dun sa mining code. And then, uh, uh, make sure that uh, may technical capacity yung Basamora government uh, to properly uh, um, govern and uh, monitor the monitor the projects in its in its region. So, that's for the uh, for the impact of the COVID-19 Um, in the area, again, for the metallic mining sector, at metallic lang naman, I think metallic lang naman yung relevant ngayon sa Bangsamora because wala pang non-metallic, uh, wala ding oil, gas, and coal. Uh, pero sa industry outlook ng PHEITI, ang medyo na-apektuhan uh, across the country ay yung non-met, and of course, oil and gas because of the uh, uh, the the drop in demand uh, for, for these uh, commodities. But for metallic, again, walang masyadong impact uh, continuous yung operation ng ng industry and again malaki na itulong nila sa pandemic response uh, now for the second question the um, lessons learned that uh, the national government can share with uh, the Bangsamoro government to um, improve mining policy institutional capacity and practices to ensure the accountability and sustainability sustainable development of mining benefits for their citizen um, siguro susuga natin yung sa BK report Uh, tala, dapat talaga magsimula dun sa uh, uh, mining code or maybe sa revenue code also. Um, simulan doon, ano ba yung mga policies, ano ba yung mga principles na dapat malagay doon. And uh, uh, bilang transparency initiative, we would suggest the following. Number one, uh, include provisions on transparency uh, and accountability. Increase transparency and accountability in the executive's value chain from the ap- application of and granting of permits and licenses to government revenue collection, distribution, and utilization will help facilitate data-informed policies and programs towards sustainable resource utilization and local social development and economic growth. We, all, we always need data uh, as baseline for any policy that uh, we would like to develop. And uh, uh, as a presentation at our earlier, isa rito sa mga nabanggit niya yung, yung transparency and also um, availability of data. With timely and reliable data, the Bangsamora government can forecast annual local revenue, which in turn would support better local planning. So if we cannot forecast what we will receive for the next few years, uh, para ang hirap magplano, saan ba natin kukunin yung mga uh, pondo for the projects and programs that we want? So um, at the onset, we hope that uh, the mining code or the revenue code that will be developed uh, 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 related or parang relevant sa mining industry um, would at the onset include transparency and accountability mechanisms. If not the EITI, uh, if not hindi, if hindi yung mismong EITI standard, at least the principles of EITI, transparency and accountability. And um, I think it will be helpful uh, for uh, the national government and the Bank Samoa government to have an established system of coordination Uh, that will support alignment of priorities and initiatives in terms of mineral and energy 
resource development, especially that in the Bangsamoro organic flow, uh, merong mga commodities that uh, the national government, the government and Bangsamoro government um, should, uh, parang ang provision ay, they, they, sh they should be jointly uh, um, facilitating or managing those resources, yung oil, gas, uh, uranium, ganyan. Um, and then, uh, the role of the IED, uh, I was informed by our legal affairs office that uh, there is an intergovernmental energy board under the IGRB that is on top of this, um, trying to uh, uh, screen some policy recommendations by the sa energy and mining um, research development. So it, the, I, the IED will be very uh, instrumental towards this purpose. Um, also, it's important uh, that, uh, that um, any policy, any program, will be based on or will be anchored uh, on or to a consistent engagement and consultation with stakeholders. Um, we we, we uh, suggest that the Bangsamora government will ensure this so that uh, policy, policies and programs are always inclusive and always responsive to the needs and aspirations of the Bangsamora uh, people, um, including subgroups such as women, children, and indigenous people. So, uh, meaningful consultation palagi. Uh, and then there is an upcoming uh, my, MICC baka nga nagsimula na um, MICC mining audit. Um, the first two phases uh, were very successful and there were very useful um, useful policy recommendations. Uh, and uh, and we, we, uh, the, the third phase uh, they said will cover the metallic industry in BARM. So we hope that the BARM government will, will uh, uh, cooperate in this uh, in this uh, mining audit because it will be very useful for you, the policy recommendations that will result from um, this mining audits. It will help the, the region to uh, better chart a mining code or a mining code or revenue code for, for the region. Um, some of the recommendations from the first two phases include streamlining compliance monitoring and enforcement of regulatory policies, revisiting the mining law to address overlapping and outdated provisions. Um, actually, in the PHE ATI, we have a technical working group that's uh, uh, reviewing the Philippine Mining Act also, and there are recommendations to include provisions on gender inclusion, uh, revise the provisions on social payments or the SDMP, also for the FDIC process and the IP royalty payment. So, sa umpisa pa lang sana makonsider na yon ng uh, Bangsang Moro government in uh, crafting its mining code. Um, ano ba? So I, I think yun yung mga uh, mahalaga na nalista namin that the Bangsang Moro government should consider to uh, improve its uh, mining policies. But uh, may I just also add for I end uh, that uh, yung ibang mga binanggit sa report, we agree uh, in some of the items there. Um, particularly, I realized that uh, while while skimming through the report, that education campaigns are also important because the report mentioned that uh, some of the some locals do not understand, uh, cannot discuss competently um, some of the issues. May may mga media uh, personalities na they they would they would like to discuss some of the issues, but they cannot because they are not well informed about the issues. They do not know how to discuss it. So. Uh, maybe the PHE, ITI, or BK can help in this area by uh, implementing education campaigns. We used to have media fellowships, so uh, if if with enough funding or with enough support, maybe we could uh, come up with a uh, media fellowship program in the Bangsamoro region uh, to, to address that concern. Meron uh, din concern tayo sa geological data and harmonization of data. I, Attorney Ron uh, always mentions this in MSG meetings na uh, iba yung data ng PHE ATI, iba yung data ng MGD. So there should be a harmonization of data para pag tumitingin tayo, pareho na yung data na, na, na nababasa natin. Kanina lang magkiba ka ng data ni Ator Gulon. And then, uh, I just also would like to mention that uh, one of the actionable policy options 2.2, uh, the, the continuation of the moratorium on MPSA, um, hindi siya... Hindi siya masyadong consistent with EO 130, but we understand that uh, the Bangsamoro region has autonomy. Um, and, uh, uh, and okay din yun na magpatuloy because uh, wala pang ang mining code. But uh, we just gusto lang namin i-highlight na uh, at the national level, nag-open na yung government to um, uh, 
uh, issue new mineral agreements to support uh, um, post-pandemic economic uh, recovery. And then we also note that on page 39 of the report, there are, there are already um, suggested revenue streams that might be considered for the mining code or the revenue code. Um, I would like to mention that the DOF is also pushing for a single fiscal mining uh, regime, uh, but it's not clear if the Bank Samoro will be included in this uh, But uh, our uh, suggestion is for the, for the Bank Samoro government to also already consider um, the version of the government of the DOF. Baka may iba mga provisions to and that the Bank Samoro government uh, would like to adopt. And uh, consistent naman ito sa suggestion din ni uh, Attorney Roy uh, na magkaroon ng uh, progressive na fiscal regime for mining sa Bank Samoro. Um, I wouldn't discuss yung specific, uh, specific uh, provisions under the proposed uh, fiscal policy regime by the DOF, but if, if that would be, uh, kung gusto nyo pong malaman yun, pwede naman natin i-share uh, later. Uh, so I think that's all from my end. Uh, I hope we were able to answer the questions given to the Department of Finance. Thank you, Jelson, and to all our participants. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, you did more than what was asked. Uh, so, um, but very briefly lang, I think uh, there's so much that, uh, that, that needs to be cited here. First of all, uh, thank you for uh, reading the report. Uh, it, it, it does look like you have scrutinized it, which is good. And what we're hearing is that there's many alignment of the of the proposals in the report with the thinking or or the position, if you like, of the DITI and the Department of Finance. But more than that, I think there are three things that need to be mentioned here. One is uh, the impact of COVID to metallic mines is not that severe and to explain that. I think that's an important takeaway here. Number two, it's uh, good to know that engagement with the Bangsamoro government is one of the work, is in the work plan. Dax, uh, you're muted. All right. Uh, sorry, I think that we there was an automatic uh, muting here. So I just want to mention also that uh, thank you also for highlighting that engagement with the BARM is in your PHEITI work plan. I hopefully. Uh, the Menre will take that offer considering the many offerings that you provide, not just in terms of fellowship or data crunching, but uh, being an EITI member or collaborator can be their instrument up to strengthen interagency collaboration and also to bridge the gap uh, and also to harmonize some of the data that can be uh, obtained, not just for mining, but also for the hopefully for the oil and gas. No? Uh, the thing is that I think this discussion already uh, sets a further catalyzes the eventual, eventual uh, partnership of Bantay Kita with the Banks uh, Moro. Uh, the fact is, I think all the, the directors of Mendre are actually joining us. They're not actually joining us in person in IAG conference room, but because of the safety protocol, they were asked to participate by online. So I think they, they received your message loud and clear. So I think, thanks, Vince. Uh, sorry, Vince, sorry. Uh, uh, we're now moving to uh, Pak uh, Sherwan Ananda Idris, who I think is the, the good fit for this conversation. Uh, you may say that oh, how, uh, he, he has a lot of experience in the oil and gas in Indonesia, having been a, a former senior executive for Total, ENP, and then Stat Oil Indonesia. But he himself is quite engaged in the mining, in part because he used to be the national coordinator of uh, EITI Indonesia. So he can relate with what uh, 
East has mentioned, but also he also brings the comparative experience of how mining and other uh, natural resources are managed in Indonesia as well as in in Madagascar. But something closer to home also is that when I speaking to him last Saturday is that consider Bangsamoro to be to have some similarities with Banda Aceh uh, because they themselves also have their own autonomy and they have their own uh, uh, strong um, ownership and management responsibility over the management of the natural resources, including, of course, the oil and gas. So perhaps you could also draw lessons uh, uh, from that experience and then share that uh, in this conversation. So basically, I ask him the same question. Uh, Pak Ananda, thank you for joining us. Teram, uh, silamat pagi. Uh, so again, in your view, how is the COVID-19 health crisis affecting the mining market and mining operations in Indonesia? Uh, what do you think are, uh, are, are making the Indonesian uh, mining industries resilient while maintaining their uh, social, financial, uh, uh, fiscal, and environmental obligations? And also, what lessons can you draw from Indonesia and Myanmar with respect to uh, reforming or improving the mining industry in, in Bangsamoro. I know that you yourself are quite involved in, um, geo, in mining in, uh, in energy advisory group uh, that also looks at the uh, issue beyond mining. And then you, you, talk to, you also talk about the energy transition and what's the future role of, of mining in a post-pandemic world and also in a Paris uh, climate uh, uh, obligations, considering that many governments have made their own uh, commitments to implement that. So how does that uh, relate also with Bank Samoro? So over to you, Pat Ananda. Thank you, uh, Jelson. Can, can everybody hear me? Clear. OK, thank you, uh, Jelson. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Well, to tell you the truth, Jelson, uh, the pandemic, the, 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 especially now the Omicron pandemic in the industry, in the mining industry and the oil and gas industry in Indonesia has not been very, very significant because the economic activities has not decreased uh, the way some people thought it would. And that, that the mining operations and the, and, the, and, the, and the oil and gas operations have been very, very, in, in very remote areas. And like I think one of your speakers mentioned earlier, because this is considered as a as a as a as a strategic industry, uh, the, the 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 minor incident that has been detected, the, the authorities will will jump into it and send uh, send health teams uh, to 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 isolate everybody and to have everybody vaccinated, isolated, and so on. So uh, I'm I'm not sure that uh, that. Uh, that uh, the the pandemic has uh, has much influence on uh, on this sector. To answer the other parts of your question, uh, uh, Jelson, I just want to I just uh, everything has been said uh, by your previous speakers, and I think you are you 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 have you have seen you have seen the problems from every side from every side of uh, of the issues. But I want put I want to put it in the Indonesian perspective, and like you said, Jelson. Uh, 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 in, in, in the Aceh perspective, because uh, it, 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 it is a semi-autonomous -auto region, and maybe maybe in your area is also a semi has a semi-autonomous status. But I want to put this in a, in a, in a global context, where the country is 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 thinking more than more than regional issues, more than than the sanitary issues, and uh, it's it's uh, and very sensitive. First of all. There is a government. There is uh, the, in the in, in the constitution of the of the of the Republic of Indonesia, we have what is called Article Thirty Three, which says that the, the that the natural resources in this country belongs to the state and will be managed by the state for the best interest of the people. This is the this is the Article Thirty Three of the Indonesian Constitution. So everything is based on Article 33 of the Constitution. 
So what does this mean to many people? It can mean many things to many people, especially in a democracy like ours. So this is what, what, what the government needs to be very careful about is to give the same definition of what Article 33 means to many people. Because the regional government would say, the governor would say, no, this is for the government. The benefit of the people would be for the government. The central government would say the benefit of the of the people would say when when the revenues goes into the into the state budget. So it can mean anything to, to a lot of people. So in the past, when we had a, we had a, we had a, a centralized government, this has been very well implemented. I would say, I hate to say it, but it has been well implemented because there were, there has been a strong a strong leadership. And in this, in cases like this, in cases like this, we need to have a very good institutional framework and a very good regulatory framework. I think your speakers mentioned earlier that you have also thought about this, but what is a good institutional framework and what is a good regulatory framework? This has to be voted by, by, by the parliament. And if you change governments, you change governments, especially if you change presidents, you change the way the parliament works and you change the way people look how, 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 how the regulatory framework should work in the mining industry for this government versus for what the next government would be. So this, is, this has been a very critical issue for us in Indonesia. I take the example of, of, the, of the oil and gas law. The oil and gas law, the, la the, the, the last oil and gas law, uh, which has been voted in, was in 2001. We know that as from 2001, many issues have developed because of the change of the industry, because of the, the changes we, we look at things, the, because of the changes of the global, global economy. We need to change this oil and gas law. Until now, 20, 20 something years later, we still don't have a new oil and gas law, whereby, the mining law, in three months, it has been discussed in parliament, in four months, it has been discussed in parliament, and it has been passed by parliament in four months. So you can guess what happened. I, I, I don't need to tell you, but, uh, but this, is, this, is, this is very critical. This is very critical for us here in Indonesia, where the oil industry cannot work because we don't have an oil and gas law because the renewable energy cannot work because we don't have a renewable energy uh, renewable energy law because it has been it has been on the table for for many many years not only not only you need the law but you also need the decrees because below the law you need you need the ministerial decrees you need the governor decrees you need you need the sub governor decrees to 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 make the industry work and to tell you the truth this is not working quite well here in our country. I hope it works. I hope it would work well in your country, but uh, 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 we have not seen. We have not been able to see the, how things, how these things could work here, at 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 this point. In two thousand four, we will have a new president presidential election. Maybe we have a new parliament, and I I fear that we will we will start we will start again from zero. I hope not. But it can happen if we have a new president and so on. Second of all, we have to remind ourselves that the, 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 the natural resources, especially natural resources with regards to energy, oil, gas, coal, and, and in a way mining as well, those are non-renewable resources. So you have to think, we have to think, not you, we have to think what goes beyond this we have we are we have very low we have very low reserves on oil and gas now we have we are starting to have low reserves on coal what do you do after that these are these are things that people need to think about and people don't think about they think they think that they can use oil and gas they can use coal uh, 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 on a switch of a button and and, and forget what about. That's why it is very important for our country to face in a new type of energy, renewables. 
And everybody's talking about this, not because the reserves are declining, but because of how to manage how to manage uh, 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 global warming, how to manage the reduction of carbon emissions, how to achieve a net zero emission. We need to think about that, our country. Our country needs to think about that, that we have to phase out fossil fuel, we need to phase in renewables. And many people, many, 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 many agency like ours, like Jelson mentioned earlier, I'm part of a think tank that, that, that kinds of uh, tries to, to, to formulate what should be done in the next few years when, when, our, when, our, when our natural resources decline and when we should face in renewable resources. But how, how, how do we do that? We don't have the regulations, we don't have the infrastructure, we don't have the, we do, we, we, we don't have the funding, we don't have the funding, fund, funding necessary. Because energy is very important, at least for, 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 for the next few, few years, and energy has been very important in, in, in the last few years because of its accessibility, of its availability, and of its affordability. These are the three points, the three points that our country needs to think of we did think of it in the past years, but we need to think of think of it in the future. And I think your 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 speakers have mentioned earlier in a different way how how this works in 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 the, in, in the region in the in, in the region you in the region you mentioned. So one of the one of the conclusions I would put for our country at least is that we need to have a roadmap to phase out fossil fuel. We need to have a roadmap to phase in renewables. How do you do renewables? We, we, we don't even know what renewables is. Is it solar? Is it wind? Is it tide? Is it nuclear? Is it, uh, we, 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 we don't know, we don't know. And uh, many countries haven't, 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 haven't had any thought about it because they think they have, they have uh, 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 a lot of natural resources that can go on for the next 10, 15, 20 years, but, but, we need to be very careful that that at, at a certain moment, at a certain moment, uh, at the COP 27 or the COP 28, people will say, "Hey, you, 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 you are, you are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you have too much carbon emission, and when will you, when will you reach your net zero emission?" So we need to think about that. <coughs> and the, the 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 last part of the of the. Of the of the of the discussion, I would want to, to to put on the table here, is that what we have done in the past, I think you mentioned it in your in one of your slides, uh, Jelson, is how to manage the global value chain, the, the the global value chain, the global value chain has to be under a, a very strong leadership from the very upstream to the very downstream. You had a very good chart. Uh, you had a very good chart, Jelson, which mentioned this. And what we did quite well, even very well, in the past regimes, because it was a it was a very author authoritarian regime, and which is kind of dis dismantling because we are we are we are democrat democratizing ourselves, because between the upstream, between the downstream, and between the midstream. There needs to be a good, strong coordination. I remember when I was in Total, I cannot sell LNG to Japan. I can I cannot, sorry, I cannot have, have a drilling permit from the upstream regulator if Indonesia has not signed an LNG contract with Japan on the downstream side. So the whole value chain is under under under, under one management. This is something I think. A new way of of of, uh, of 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 managing the chain should be should 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 be thought of. How can you develop a, uh, develop a field on this end end of the chain when you don't even know how, how what the price of what the price of coal or what the price of oil what the price of gas would be at the uh, at, at the other end of the chain? This is this is very important. So. Uh, this is this is one one side. 
the second the second part is uh, uh, to be to be self reliance don't depend too much on 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 imports don't depend too much on on if you can if you can if you can you can have a, 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 a using using the, the, the domestic products uh, using the, the uh, domestic produced products it would be it would be much better than realizing ourselves on 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 a port especially on technology so this is especially when you want to build when you build uh, uh, infrastructure so this is uh, uh, this is also this is also very important so this these are these are part of the of the things that i just want to want to want to convey and uh, I'm I'm open to 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 any discussion. I don't think I would be able to follow the details of uh, of your of, of your following discussions because you you have thought of everything. In fact, you have thought of everything. I just want to put the I just want to put the things into the context of the of the uh, of the Indonesian of the of, of the Indonesian uh, in a, a Indonesian side and. Uh, and, and there's one thing I, I, I need to, to, to mention also is that the industry, uh, I think one of your speakers mentioned earlier, should be a growth driver, economic growth driver, and should have an economic multiplier effect. We have changed our, we have changed our mindset uh, uh, for the past few years already that it is not, not anymore a revenue earner. We don't want to put that in our minds. We don't want to put that 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 the the oil industry it, it, it brings to the government uh, so much money to the to the state budget. No, that's not that's not the most important. The most important is that the oil industry in the country is a growth driver and it creates multiplier effect for the region. It, it for the region it uh, it's uh, for for the region it it operates. So these are these are these are these are the main main messages uh, uh, based on my experience, whether in Indonesia or in Madagascar, because in Madagascar it's the same thing. In Madagascar we start from zero. We 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 discovered we discovered a, a big field and uh, and and the Madagascar said uh, we need to develop this oil field, but we as a company they need us to help them build their their oil and gas law. So you know, so uh, it's it's even it's 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 even uh, uh, in a much earlier stage than 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 you. It's of course in a much later state stage than us. But they see us because uh, we we have uh, we have a kind of uh, ancestor relation. They see us as 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 big brothers to, to to which they can they can seek advice. They don't want advice from the Europeans or the Americans. They want advice from their cousins who comes from from the other side of the Indian Ocean. So these 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 are these are the things I have been very involved with and uh, and uh, and uh, very familiar with and very based on what on the points that I have mentioned to you earlier. Well, Jason, I think uh, that, that that's about it. I'm open to any questions, of course, uh, during the discussions. And uh, Jason has my email. And uh, if you have uh, if if you if you have any questions you want to put uh, uh, by email, you can always go through Jason, or maybe Jason will put it uh, will put it on this uh, on this on this board uh, uh, much later. Thank you very much, uh, my Filipino friends. Thank you very much, Jason, for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, to talk about this. And I hope you have very much luck in exploiting. Yeah, the, the 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 mining industry in 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 your in your in your country uh, uh, very soon. Good evening. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Pak Ananda. That's very well uh, uh, delivered. Also in terms of of the content, maybe just a little bit of a quick backgrounder also on the contribution of oil gas. Uh, coal and minerals in Indonesia. Because when I was based there for over three years, I was actually doing the research then. And I don't have the exact figure. And I was looking at the uh, Indonesia ATI report in terms of the contribution. At the time, combined the petroleum and uh, metallic uh, minerals, uh, uh, more or less 40% of the annual uh, revenue collections are actually coming from the industry. And that's why I said it's a resource-rich 
uh, resource-based economy um, with a significant contribution to GDP, also to poverty reduction. Uh, that's number one. I think that's where we would like to locate the role of mining and other natural resources in the Indonesian economy. Um, so I think that's I think important to start with. Um, while he did not delve into some other details which have been uh, handled by the previous speakers, I think it's the, one of the immediate significance of your uh, presentation is to bringing us back to some of the so-called fundamentals of, uh, of, of the industry. One is that it's a non-renewable resource. Done well, it could certainly power the economy uh, and also reduce extreme poverty done poorly, then it could only exacerbate uh, uh, poverty, resource-based conflicts, and other forms of inequality. And I think this is also quite highlighted in the report. Uh, number two, um, mentioning that this is also a renewable resource, uh, once they have been mined out and fully extracted, I think it's also important to think long-term about what's the strategy when the reserves are continuously declining. And even if they are reserved, they are quite difficult to be located and you have to invest a lot of money, technology, human resources, because certainly extracting them and putting them to market would be quite uh, expensive. And that's number two. Number three, I think you brought us back to the importance of how to manage these renewable resources for long-term benefits of their citizens. And I think you highlighted the importance of good or robust regulatory and institutional framework, which are also highlighted in the report. And I know that this is also one of the key considerations of MENRE. Because last year, they have presented the strategic priorities of MENRE. And certainly, this is mentioned in their, in their so-called roadmap. But uh, definitely, there needs to be a lot of uh, implementing mechanisms, framework, resources to make that happen. And certainly, the development of the mining code is one of their priorities in their strategic priorities. So I think it's a very good reminder, Pak. Um, finally, the importance of uh, locating the, the, the use development of our the natural resources within the law. So you mentioned the Article 33, and I think this is actually where the Bangsamoro Organic Law is really uh, making those clear provisions. Uh, it mentions minerals, natural resources, not just as part of the sustainable development strategy of Bangsamoro, but also as an essential uh, tool to realize its fiscal autonomy. Uh, I think certainly we can have different discussion on that. No, this has been tackled in other uh, discussions also by IAG. But good to mention those. Uh, you also mentioned about the importance of linking upstream decisions with the downstream activities. Uh, important salt of self reliance. Uh, also, we look also at the role of uh, renewables in the energy transition. I believe this is also mentioned in the strategic priority of MENRE, but how do you make that happen? I think one of the good starting points is how, where, does, where, where this fit in the mining code that will be developed. So I think your interventions come at the right time and it fits within the overall framework of the discussion. So uh, I recognize that there's also already a question coming from uh, Senior Minister Makakua. There's a question actually for the panelists. I will reserve that. So uh, I mentioned earlier that we will have a, a five-minute break. I think we're going to cancel that for now because a lot of you uh, can always take your break while people are, are speaking. And I know that we have already set the momentum for people not just to listen, but to formulate their questions. So on that note, uh, please uh, keep having your break uh, while, we, con while uh, we continue the conversation. I will, let's now move to the uh, um, panel uh, of reactors to respond to what they heard. Uh, are, uh, do, are the things that we have heard from the, from the speakers uh, re 
relevant to them? Do this resonate to their own issues or policy recommendations or institutional recommendations? So we'll have to hear that. Now, I recognize that uh, we this meeting is predominantly populated by male without being discriminatory, but it's almost like a manel, no? man-only panel. So uh, we recognize that that is the weakness of, of this forum. So uh, we're going to start the response uh, by calling on Ms. Arlene uh, Sevilla, the executive director of the Tawi-Tawi Coalition of Civil Society Organization to uh, hear her feedback on what occurred and what are the key recommendations that she would like to uh, reiterate in this discussion. So, uh, Mom Marlene, um, over to you, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Greetings from the province of Tawi Tawi. Um, on on the first presenter po, kay Attorney Ronald Residero, when he talked of uh, mining activities and um, citing the Mining Act of the Philippines where our mining companies should set aside for environmental protection and social development. Uh, this has been my, ano, my, my issue and my fight whenever we do mining visitation, we do our quarterly mining visitation and in the one, two, three, four mining companies operating in the province of Tawi-Tawi. For the reason that um, we have seen that the environmental protection uh, is not strictly followed by the mining companies and social development uh, plans Except for except for Pax Libera, who does uh, that does community consultation uh, in Sitio Tamban, social development management plan were according to him, in which we observed is for compliance purposes only. It comes from up down. It does not include. Uh, it does not involve community community people to uh, plan for, their, for themselves for the um, post mining life that they will have when the mine companies get out of the place. So connecting this to the presentation of, um, yeah, the second speaker from E. EITI represent, uh, representing Assistant uh, DOF Secretary Valerie Joy Bryan, where there is, there is uh, a mandatory participation or publication of um, what we call publish, uh, publish what you, what you, what you pay. When we conducted an audit way back, uh, way back in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, when mining operations in Tawi Tawi were were stopped, um, we have been looking into into their presentation, into the report on what they what they got from from the mining company, uh, from the mining communities, from the host communities, and. It's it is so sad for um for five 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 annual EITI meetings uh, held in Manila. No single no single mining company operating in Tawi Tawi attended such event. So we could not even uh, we could not though we raised we raised our concerns our our issues and concerns before the before that an uh, August body. No one from the mining companies could directly answer and respond to our questions because we were so concerned on the community wealth fund. Um, where does the one 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 to 1.5% go for for the, the that the community must uh, should have should have received from the mining companies? Um, 
hindi hindi kasi siya kita at hindi siya ramdam when you when you go to host communities they still uh, live in a very this um they live in shanty shanty houses made of bamboo made of uh coconut leaves uh, as roofs and and yet we know some people are full, uh, filling up their pockets and their bank accounts out of the minerals taken from the from that uh, mining community from that community so is there an uh, is there a penalty uh, so uh, i am throwing this to the mine chamber in eiti is there a penalty to be exacted from the mining companies not attending EITI events and not publishing what they what they pay because community consultation must be inclusive and they should they should be consulted on how would their community look like after post mining uh, activities in their area now on Sir Idris, the advisor of, for, and former senior executive of Total ENP Stat Oil in Indonesia. It is, it is good to say that we should not depend too much on import, in, imports and when there is so much uh, resources available in the area, then let's make use of the domestic products and produce our own. Um, Taking taking note on this, how prepared is Barm? How prepared is Barm into producing nickel, into producing uh, the end products of the nickel ore, the end products of the iron of uh, the alloys found found in the Bangsamoro areas, that it would not affect the community and the environment because after after all these um, economic activities at the end of the day it will still be the people the bangsamoro people and it will still be the environment for the next generation the next anak apu of the bangsamoro uh, region that would either benefit or uh, incur the wrath of nature when environment is destroyed. So reading all the recommendations of Bantai Kita uh, in all the studies conducted, in all the surveys conducted, we in the civil society and for, uh, even in the academy, being a professor in Tawi Tawi Regional Agricultural College, we want we want that the mining companies and whenever the mining code will be created will be developed will be uh finally um approved by the bangsamoro uh transition authority by our honorable members of the parliament then there should be a provision for the include uh, for an inclusive inclusive when we say inclusive not selected not pinpointed by authorities but those who are coming from the community themselves and let them work with work with uh, other stakeholders that would ensure the implementation and proper utilization of the community wealth fund for their education for the health of the community for um the future of the children and the grandchildren of the host communities. Um, initially, that uh, that are those are my uh, thoughts for the first three, and I might be able to um, raise some uh, sometime later. Thank you, and wabado wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikum salam. Kama ba? Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Ma Marlene. Um, I think very, very pointed questions. Uh, it shows that you have um, earnestly listened to the conversation. Thank you. So 
I will call the respondent uh, accordingly. Um, and then uh, before we pass on to uh, Mr. Jeffrey later, uh, just to quickly reiterate, this is a question to Attorney uh, Ron, Ronnie, uh, Ronald Residero. Uh, the experience in Tawi Tawi is that while there's supposed to be a, a fund set aside for community uh, development and environmental protection, in many cases, uh, companies do not comply with them, except a company like Pax Libera. Uh, and then when it comes to developing the community uh, development plan, uh, often this is uh, decisions is being top down and communities are not uh, involved, thereby diminishing the importance and also uptake on the development plan. And also, I think another question is, so what do we do to companies that also do not uh, attend community consultation when questions about community development plan is important, but this is left unanswered because there is no presence from the company. So what's the penalty that can be expect, you know, uh, exacted to them, especially when this is already, they are members of the AITI, no? Um, that's one. And I think it also relates with uh, her question uh, to East about the conducting audit sometime in 2016, 2017, and when they asked about what the mining company was providing in terms of community development fund, they were not present. So I think this is a good question. Let's start with Attorney Residoro and then uh, straight to you, East. Thank you, Jelson. Um, in regards to penalties, uh, the current Mining Act prescribes that if you do not uh, uh, anybody to spend, if you do not spend uh, the required minimum for SDMP, that's a violation of your mineral uh, contract, your, of your MPSA. And that could be grounds for suspensions and penalties. You know? um, uh, although the, the, the mechanism is such that the mining company and the community are supposed to come up with a five-year development plan. Within that five years, the mining company commits um, to spend X million pesos, no? And that, that five-year plan is further divided into one-year chunks. So every year, Alimbawa, the company commits to spend 100 million in five years. So every year, on average, it commits to spend 25 million, diba? In some cases, mining companies and the community themselves are not ready to absorb 25 million within one year. So very often, the, the mechanism is such that any unspent commitment for year one will be carried over to year two, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the fifth year, you should have spent, in our example, 100 million. No? So uh, a mining company who has not spent in the first year, for instance, can say, uh, can explain to the, co to the community saying, uh, we cannot spend uh, this commitment yet because the necessary groundwork has not yet been laid. No? So, our commitment namin is to double our expenditure next year. So that's, that's a possible explanation bakit hindi nagastos this year. But that presupposes na pinag explain sila ng MGB. They are asked to explain bakit hindi nyo nagastos. No, so a similar mechanism should be put in place in the, in the proposed mining law of the barn. Na... There should be a mechanism to check annual expenditure on community development projects. And if the commitment is not actually expended, the mining company should be asked to explain. And if the explanation is not satisfactory, then the proper penalties should be meted out. No? Uh, on the second question of uh, 
mining companies not joining consultations for the development of community development programs. Uh, well, that's really something for the mines and geosciences uh, section to, to ensure. They have to ensure that um, the consultation involves uh, multi-party company and the community. And I would even hasten to suggest now, wag lang mining company and community. We also involve developmental experts and mm. even the local development uh, heads of the LGU concerned. No, para there is alignment, there is harmonization, and we are moving in the same direction. Very often, kasi ang nakikita namin on the ground is that mining communities seeing that this uh, SDMP is a large windfall of money that comes every year, minsan wala na silang mahingi eh. Uh, they've asked for all the waiting sheds and basketball courts and covered courts and community centers that they can ask for. Re uh, forgetting, for instance, to ask for more scholarships for their children, more training for entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial um, opportunities. That sort of thing. Yeah. The, the tendency is to ask for more infra eh, rather yeah. than capacity building. Infra is very hard to sustain. No? Hence the need for expert intervention in some cases. Yeah. So, attorney, attorney Risidoro, yeah, if I could actually interject on that, because I think before I pass it on to, to East, is that in our report, there was actually a mention about the importance of strengthening not just the composition, but also the function of the multi-party uh, monitoring team, which is actually being installed in, 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 in Tawi Tawi. And one thing that we have identified there is the lack of some uh, members that have the subject matter expertise in some areas. No? I think that's, that's that's lacking, and also how you can also ensure the 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 technical participation of some LGUs, and also how the community's voices are actually incorporated. So that's one. Another thing that that needs to be mentioned here, Kili would like, Marlene, Arlene would like to ask you a question is, um, what's the responsibility in terms of disclosure and consultation of companies that are already approaching the decommissioning phase because I see that at least one uh, mining operations in Langui, in Tawi Tawi, when we visited there, they're just about to to enter the last phase, no? Uh, so it's a question of developing the decommissioning plan. Um, what should be the provisions there with, uh, that should be expected from the company in terms of developing the commissioning plan and the engagement of the communities involved? Thanks. Uh, if you look at mining companies operating now uh, outside the barn, uh, they are all required to have a final mine decommissioning and uh, FMRDP, final mine rehabilitation, rehabilitation and decommissioning plan. At the outset, huh? start pa lang, they should already have that. But uh, you funding it, actually putting money in the bank to fund that plan, happens at the latest five years before your intended closure. So but five years before your planned closure, dapat fully funded na ang iyong final mine decommissioning plan. No? Now that plan is not developed by the mining company exclusively. That has to be done in consultation with the community and it has to be approved by the government para multipartite ang approvals natin. No? Uh, otherwise, kung if you leave it just to the mining company, baka compliance lang yan. They will just, you know, uh, tatambakan lang yung butas and then that's it. Pero hindi po pwedeng ganun, hindi ba? It has to, we have to give it back to the community in essentially the same state that you found it in. So taniman mo yan ang puno, or if that's not possible, you convert it into some other productive land use that the community can, can use. 
Thank you, you Attorney Rishidoro. I know that there could be some follow-up questions, but in the interest of time, let's move to East. Uh, I think he already knows the questions for him. But before him, I just want to acknowledge that we are being joined by, for, uh, by Director General Mohajuddin Ali, who is the, heading the uh, Bangsamoro Planning and Development uh, Authority. Thank you, sir. It's good to see you for the first time. Thank you for joining us, however busy you are. I know that you couldn't join us uh, tomorrow, but I will give you the floor to speak a little later if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. If that's the case, then uh, I'll wait. I'll, I'll, I'll speak na lang later. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay, is your turn. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jelson. And uh, uh, there's a question, Imam Arlene, uh, regarding uh, what if the companies are not submitting data to PHEITI or not disclosing data. Um, for the rest of the country, the other uh, regions, uh, other provinces outside of farm and uh, mining companies outside uh, outside of farm they are uh, the mine the mining companies are mandated by the department by the dnr administrative order 2017-7 to really submit data required by the phe idi now the sanctions include um the suspension if, if they did not participate that if if they did not comply with all the requirements that includes uh, the data and also supporting documents, uh, they will be uh, um, they will be issued with a show cause order to explain why they did not participate. And the possible sanctions are the suspension of the pertinent environmental compliance certificate or the ECC, and the non issuance of ore transport and or mineral export permit. So at the end of every reporting cycle, we submit to the MGB a list of companies that uh, did not participate. And then the M MGB will uh, issue showcase orders and then the companies will explain why they did not participate. Some of the reasons for not participating are, um, for instance, they do not have data to report anyway because they are suspended or they are not operating as of the moment. Um, and then uh, some of the companies, uh, uh, yeah, they, they have been suspended uh, 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 for, for some time, especially during the time of uh, the late uh, DNR secretary, uh, Regina Paz Lopez. Now, now that's that's for the rest of the country. For the bar, uh, that is something that the that that the bar Baksamara government could consider adopting. Um, if if they if the uh, if the Baksamara government so decides to implement the EITI, um, anytime soon. So that, that's a policy that uh, the Baksamara government could consider. And mabilis lang magchime in lang ako din kay attorney Ron. Yun nga. Uh, so. I understand, I'm not a lawyer, but from my limited understanding, if uh, in the absence of a mining code, uh, the Philippine Mining Act will prevail. So, dahil wala pa ng mining code, yung Philippine Mining Act yung parang applicable uh, sa Bangsamora government as of the moment. So, um, yung, uh, sabi, sabi ni Attorney Ron, meron ng mga provisions doon uh, mandating the companies to uh, comply with the requirements. And actually, the MGP, has what they call a checklist. So there, there is a checklist that the MGB uh, uh, uses to monitor the compliance of companies with, with these requirements. So maybe that's something that the uh, Bangsamora government could also consider um, when it uh, uh, when it finally crafts its uh, mining code, um, those mechanisms that are already in place uh, for the rest of the country. Um, so there. Thank you, Jelson. So uh, maybe in terms of the sequence, after uh, uh, Pak Ananda addresses the question on the downstream, uh, Jeffrey, I hope that it's okay that we're going to save the, the, the last for you because I know that uh, DG Ali uh, will have his uh, event uh, coming up soon. So after Doc, uh, Ananda Idris, I'm going to call uh, DG Ali and then after him is you... Uh, uh, Jeffrey, if it's okay, no? So, no worries. Yeah, thank you. Pak Ananda, I think if I could, in a way, reframe the question from uh, 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 Ms. Arlene, which is about the question of the downstream. I think the, the essential question there is that, number one, what is the mining downstream in Indonesia look like? Is your downstream industry that developed? I know that you have some smelter companies there already, but how far did you go? I think the question is actually predicated on 
your earlier point about the multiplier effect of mining at the local, sub-regional, uh, sub-national levels. Because I know that Indonesia, there has been this long discussion about economic diversification, which should be catalyzed by or be supported by mining. And there was even a number of studies there before that I, was my, I myself was involved that really talk about the question, has mining uh, industry in Indonesia at the downstream level been able to catalyze economic diversification with the, with the view that these resources are not going to be uh, for the long term anyway. So is there a long term development plan after a post mining scenario? I think that's where the question is actually coming in. So what's your take on that, please? Thank you, Jensen, for reformulating the question by Ms. Mrs. Arlene. And I think it's very important. It's very important. And we have been aware of this issue for quite some time already, whereby the downstream side is not too well looked into in the past. What, what has been done by the mining companies is they export the raw products. Is it right to export the raw products? Then they say, why not? It, uh, it, 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 it gives a lot of revenue for the company. It gives a lot of revenue for the country. We, 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 will export the, the, we will export raw products. But when we at one time realized that at some areas, exporting the raw products does not indicate how many of the real products are, in, are included in the exports. For example, for example, copper, when you export copper, what is the content of gold in, 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 in one ton of copper that has been exported? We don't know. And the only one who knows is that the guy or the person who processed the downstream. So at one time, when, when I mentioned in my earlier presentation that, that the country is more aware that the whole value chain should be, should be well taken off, to be well taken care of, we decided that what we should export is the processed products, smelted products, not the raw products. Then there has been a lot of talks about building smelters. There has been a lot of talks building uh, uh, processing plants. There has been a lot of talks, but nothing really happened. <coughs> nothing really happened because there were no money. Who's going to, who's going to provide for the loan? And, and, this I learned when I was at when I was at AITI. By the way, I was invited as AITI. I was invited by the Filipino Chamber of Mines in Manila. I don't know if anybody remembers that I visited at one time. And I was I was reminded during the the AITI Manila discussions. It was a regional discussion with ASEAN that many of the of, of, of many of the of the processing products mining processing products have been built in the philippines have been built in vietnam have been in thailand so why would why would why would the government at the time this was 10 15 years ago why would the government at that time 10 15 years ago build smelting pro, uh, a, a smelting plant when when there's also when there's already a a, a smelter in, in manila or in the philippines so Nothing, nothing really happened until now. Now, uh, now uh, uh, maybe you, you, have re you have looked into the books uh, that, uh, that uh, some of the big mining companies, they're start starting to build smelter. And uh, even, even a big company like Freeport in, in, in Papua, they're, they're, they're starting to build, to build, uh, to, to, to build uh, smelting. Is it too late? It's never too late. It's better late than never. But, but it, is, it is important, I think, uh, Arlene has mentioned it uh, quite well. It is, it is important. But then again, what her fear was that if you build a smelter, does it, does it affect, does it give benefit to the people in the surrounding area or not? That this is something that the regulators should, should look into. And this is something that the government should, lo should look into. So <laughs> stop exporting raw products. Build, build processing products or smelters and export finished products. Export. This is the experience I had in Madagascar as well, because in Madagascar, they, all, they also raised, raised the question, is it, uh, shall, we, shall we export the, the raw products or shall we build a smelter? It's too, it costs too much to build a smelter and so on. So it's better to invest on, the, on a smelter and export, uh, export, export finished products than to build 
uh, than to export uh, raw product, which you don't, you don't really know what the contents are. I think that's uh, that's what I would I would uh, I would add to uh, Mrs. Arlene's questions. Yeah. Thank you, Pak Ananda. And I think it's it raises also a question about is that going to be within the priority of Bangsamoro? Uh, you know, do they have the capacity to actually build the downstream industry? You know, building smelter. And I think it it, it can be, to some it may be too advanced, far fetched to have that kind of conversation now. But is that something that can be too remote, that it can be rolled out in the conversation? And I think this is where uh, DG Ali uh, should come in. I know that he's beaming. I hope that we have triggered your curiosity and response. DG Ali, I don't need to repeat what has been said. What's your view as a, the DG and uh, overseeing the planning and development uh, uh, aspect of the Bank Samoro? So over to you, DG Ali. Yes, uh, thank you very much. <coughs> Good morning to everyone, to my colleagues in the bar. I, I saw a lot of uh, MP members uh, who are present here today, and uh, especially the uh, uh, people in charge uh, for this in under the Ministry of Environment, Natural Resources and Energy. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm 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 quite familiar with this actually because uh, first uh, by profession I'm a mining engineer by profession. Um, second, uh, I was before during the time of arm leading the uh, mines and geosciences in the arm before. In fact, uh, I was there when uh, uh, the first operating mines uh, operated. Uh, um, during the time of uh, regional governor Hataman. And uh, with that, we established uh, the uh, uh, mechanisms uh, in, uh, which is uh, intended for the operation of mines. Um, and um, as what was said a while ago, uh, in the absence of any regional law, we uh, use the mining act of uh, the national law, national government. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I've heard a, a lot of uh, information from, from the first speaker uh, up to this now, and then uh, especially the uh, experience of the Indonesian government. No? I'm, I'm, I will uh, give a comment uh, 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 on the aspect of uh, the mining industry itself, mm, uh, where I, 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 I really believe that... Uh, uh, it would really uh, somehow give a very big impact to the economy if of of, of the barm if uh, the um, implementation of uh, the uh, especially on the regulatory side of the barm and then the uh, of mining operation on the mining company on their side would somehow be maximized then uh, it would really uh, give a big help in, uh, in 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 our economy. Uh, um, uh, we have also experienced that when we uh, assume uh, the arm, twenty nineteen, we were able to collect millions also of revenue from uh, the mining uh, companies, and uh, um, the challenge of sustaining it is uh, really uh, there. And um, we know also for a fact that uh, in mining industry, especially nickel, uh, which is the uh, main commodity in the province of Tawi-Tawi, the prices usually fluctuates. Uh, sometimes it's go high and sometimes it's uh, going down. And uh, that thing relies on, on, on the global market. Um, I was informed that uh, currently, uh, there's a gradual increase of the price of nickel. Um, this is because of also the effect of the pandemic, possibly. And then the, uh, the neighboring countries like Indonesia already shifted to uh, the uh, uh, processing their raw material. Uh, so they are, uh, as what was explained a while ago, they stopped already selling the raw material uh, from Indonesia because uh, they already uh, implement uh, the uh, processing of uh, nickel deposits within the country. And 
we know for a fact also that uh, processing per se is not a simple thing to do. Uh, in fact, in the country nowadays, uh, when we talk of copper deposit and uh, gold deposit, it's really, really being processed here in the Philippines. Uh, on, on the gold deposit, uh, we, we produce gold bars. And uh, on the uh, copper, uh, before we sell it to other countries, we produce copper concentrates. And uh, when we, when we uh, <clears throat> uh, do processing, uh, we need to prepare ourselves also in uh, confronting the uh, necessary uh, impact on this on the environment. Because uh, as you all know, when you try to introduce processing, then you need to prepare uh, uh, the likes of the tailing span so that you will confine the uh, waste material of uh, the process uh, commodities. So uh, <clears throat> uh, at, at some point, you will come to uh, uh, a situation that uh, you need to ask yourself, are we ready to, uh, to uh, go into the processing uh, for that? Uh, in the case of Indonesia, I think uh, there were quite a lot of years when they sell it raw, and then eventually they decide that, uh, and also because of the technology now, uh, uh, processing it's uh, quite uh, uh, somehow easy compared to previous years and with that that's why they uh, decided to process it in the, because it, when, when, when the commodity is processed then uh, the price uh, basically also increase as compared to the uh, to selling it uh, uh, to sell the, the raw material uh, I, I think um, uh, <clears throat> One of the crucial uh, things, especially for us in, in our own context, is that, um, yeah, as what was mentioned a while ago, uh, yeah, there's a really a need for us to uh, um, uh, enact our own uh, mining code no? so that, uh, that that fits for us, uh, that would basically rely on the uh, organic law, no? the 11054. And then uh, uh, it, while, while waiting for that, we could uh, somehow, uh, my colleagues from the Mandra is listening also, especially Director Remo. We we could uh, we we need to uh, do the uh, the uh, serious uh, regulatory fu functions that we have in uh, in 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 the uh, mining companies operating in the in the Tawi Tawi. One of the things that we really need there really is the political you know, in terms of this one. And then uh, in relation to this also, the uh, SDMP is also another thing. I've heard also of the SDMP mentioned a while ago, the social development and management program of the uh, mining companies. In fact, uh, uh, the representative of the civil society mentioned that uh, it's uh, for compliance, then we need to look at it uh, seriously. It, it should not be for compliance. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, the SDMP of the uh, mining companies has to be implemented on the uh, target communities that it was intended to. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and in line also with this, uh, one of the things that is very challenging also is the sustainability part of this. Uh, this is only Tawi Tawi. We have uh, a lot of potential uh, mineral resources in uh, the mainland in the province of Maguindanao, uh, Lano del Sur, and even the 63 barangays. So Tawi-Tawi uh, is already a, a, a good uh, training ground for us really on how we best manage uh, the operation of uh, mining uh, in the barn right now. Uh, I, I, I really believe that uh, <clears throat> there's really what we call the responsible mining uh, uh, for, for the entire country. Uh, in fact, uh, there are there are uh, good practices also. I, I usually mention uh, with regards to this, the operation of the Felix mining in the municipality of Padgal in uh, the north, wherein uh, they have a very very good relationship with the LGU and the uh, community on the ground uh, for this, and that's why they were able to last long. And uh, if uh, uh, some one would like to see uh, what the impact of mining have been given to the community that uh, they could also visit the uh, municipality of Padgal where uh, the Felix gold mining is operating there. Um, uh, I, I think one of uh, the, the requirements really for uh, a successful mining operation is 
to have a, a healthy relationship between the mining companies, um, especially to the uh, dire uh, you, uh, directly affected communities and the indirect, uh, indirectly affected communities uh, within the area. In the case of Tawi-Tawi, uh, 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 the municipality of Languyan is uh, the one directly affected and that would include also the uh, municipality of Panglima Sugala. Um, <clears throat> During the, during the armed days, we were able to establish a, uh, um, um, initial uh, platform like uh, what was mentioned a while ago. It's very correct that uh, the moment the companies uh, uh, start to operate, it, ha it has to submit uh, one of the documents that we require is the uh, final mine rehabilitation and development plan uh, for the mining companies. And uh, in fact, uh, with this, uh, we were able also to triggered the establishment during the time of the Mine Rehabilitation Fund, the MRF, and also the uh, op uh, operation of the Mine Rehabilitation Fund Committee uh, <clears throat> for uh, the mining operation in Tawi-Tawi. And uh, um, that's where the uh, MMT, the Mine Monitoring Team, would also uh, emanate uh, for this. These are all uh, platforms uh, that are established under the uh, current uh, uh, mining act of, of the country right now and uh, hopefully well with, with all of this uh, information that uh, 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 available that we have um, the uh, the uh, key person especially the uh, director of the mines and geosciences services with under the leadership of their minister uh, minister makakua would uh, seriously uh, look into this uh, issues and uh, um, uh, and uh, fi uh, find ways on how we will be able to uh, um, uh, closely uh, monitor and uh, uh, <clears throat> and so that uh, the uh, development programs and plans of the mining companies in Tawi Tawi will be implemented properly in the target areas. So I, I'll stop from this uh, for now, uh, sir. Uh, thank, thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be here uh, in this forum. Uh, good morning. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Thank you, DJ Ali, but I think you are not off the hook yet because there is a, an important question that was uh, forwarded to me, which is where does uh, the mining industry uh, fit into the strategic priorities of the Bangsamoro Development Plan? Uh, it, where is that located? What is the role in uh, yeah. mining mm -hmm. in the strategy? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, well, one of the strategic priorities that, that uh, currently we are looking into right now, uh, uh, um, aside from uh, the uh, 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 making sure that uh, they are all uh, compliant to the uh, environment uh, uh, protection and especially to the uh, uh, support to the communities is the uh, revenue that will be generated under this industry. Uh, it will definitely uh, boost uh, the economy if uh, we will be able to maximize it. Um, uh, yes, we do have the black grant, but uh, at, at the end of the day, for long-term uh, sustainability of our programs and projects, uh, there is really a need for us uh, to uh, enhance and uh, uh, boost the uh, revenue generations and mining industry is one of those uh, that we could have we could uh, maximize uh, to generate uh, more revenues uh, for the bar thank you. thank you dj ali and i know that is quite linked with the fiscal autonomy provisions of the bol no? so thank you sir uh, actually jeffrey again sorry but i think there are two important questions from the audience and i hope that this can be quickly addressed uh, so we have a question from MP Makakua, and this question is addressed to Attorney Ron Residero. The Bagsamoro government, this is this question, is looking forward to codify responsible mining in BARM. Now, being an expert in the field, in a nutshell, what can you recommend to have a better code for the same, aside from those being mentioned by former ASEC Sankula in his presentation? Thank you so much. So that's your question. Uh, and there's also another question. I think this question uh, would fall to um, 
East and also to uh, hopefully um, uh, Maka uh, DJ Ali, I think, has already partly addressed this, but I'll mention this anyway. This is from Ma'am Mernalin Isa of Tawi Tawi Provincial Council of Women or TPWC. Uh, this question uh, was uh, cited in the FB Live. Uh, it's mentioned the importance of strengthening the MMT composition. Uh, TPWC suggests that the host community be involved not only in the not only the barangay chairman in the monitoring, so that they can also share their issues and suggestions for the proper implementation or of SDMP and EPP. In other words, a multi-stakeholder from the community be involved, please. So I think this really fits well uh, for um, uh, is because I know that EITI has been working with a number of uh, so-called subnational EITI also, and uh, considering the multi-stakeholder uh, uh, requirement uh, to make the subnational EITI work. So I think it would be good to hear from you also on that part uh, is. So let's begin with you, uh, Attorney Risidoro. Yes, Jason, thank you. No? I, I think I presented the man the key features that a basic mining law should have no, in my presentation. Uh, enumerate ko lang ulit. Number one, you have to delineate which areas are open or closed to mining. So that will require consultation with everybody. No? You have to close off yung mga government reservations, forest watershed reserves, um, NIPAS protected areas, key tourism areas, etc. Secondly, you have to decide ano yung contracts that you want to enter, what the government wants to enter into. Whether it's a production sharing agreement, whether it's a co-venture agreement, or a, a, a co-production sharing agreement, or a joint venture. Kasi these three contracts each have their distinct advantages and disadvantages. No? While a co-production sharing agreement would give government a larger participation in the operation of the mine, it also, it also requires government to put in its own money in the operations. So there's a lot of risk involved in that. So yun, they have to decide ano kontrata ang i-issue nila. Pangatlo, you need to make sure that all contractors you, that you allow to operate within the Bank Samoro have the minimum financial and technical qualifications. Hindi yung mga fly-by-night. So taasan natin ang standards natin when it comes to our contractors. Next, um, kailangan there should be a mandatory environmental protection and enhancement program funds. Not just commitments, but actual funds deposited in escrow. No? Next, yes. kailangan may environmental impact assessment before entry so that government, the Bank Samoro government, knows exactly what's, what's going to happen. Ano yung madadamage? Ano yung kailangan ibalik ng mining company o, o i-rehabilitate or i-restore once mining is done. Next, kailangan meron tayong environmental guarantee mechanism for whenever damage or injury occurs. No, may mga tailings dam failures tayo, may mga erosions, uh, flooding. Dapat meron nakaset aside na pera ng mining company to answer for those damages. No, then that has we deposited in escrow with uh, with the government bank. Um, another important thing is to secure consents, not just from indigenous peoples, but from the community and local government units concerned. So, there is ownership. When you give your consent, you agree to this project, and you should be um, in that ownership. No? And then, lastly, I think this is most important. We have a uh, social development and management program component. Uh, the Mining Act requires an SDMP fund, no? but I think the, uh, the, bar, the BARM has an excellent opportunity to improve on the SDMP concept. Because our SDMP in the Mining Act is nearly 30 years old. No? Um, it can stand uh, improvement already. For instance, wala siyang mechanism for impact assessment. 
So, gastos ng gastos si mining company, kuha na kuha si, uh, receive ng receive si community, but we don't know how the community is actually benefited. Ano yung naging change from uh, the start to now? Tumaas ba ang antas ng kanilang edukasyon, uh, kanilang economic opportunities, ang kanilang capacities, umangat ba? We don't know. No? Uh, so these are the things that uh, a basic mining law should have. Uh, in addition, siguro dapat tignan natin talaga yung sharing. Like we mentioned kanina, uh, a fiscal regime for mining should be progressive. Right now, our current mining act is not progressive. It's based on gross uh, output, which is static. 2% of gross lang, no? But when commodities prices are high, hindi nakakasabay ang government in that windfall. Government, yeah. That's a mechanism that we should look into. Na yeah. As commodities prices rise, government share in the form of tax rate should also go up. Or we could uh, develop a mechanism where additional taxes are based on income. Because that's oh. a good measure. Pag tumataas ang income ng mining company, tumataas din yung tax rate. Not just a fixed 30, but it goes up to 31, 32%. So, so yun yung mga bagay na dapat tignan para mas malaki yung pakinabang ng tao sa isang mining project. Yeah. Thank you, Attorney Risidoro. I recognize that there is much to unpack from each of those recommendations, and that certainly requires a, you know, a follow-up, separate discussion in each of these items. And it, and I think this should also be treated with with care, especially when the provisions of the mining code would would be discussed, because you could not simply tackle environmental compliance there or oversight without also looking at the fiscal side of, of, of mining. So I see uh, uh, DJ Ali is raising his hand uh, very yeah, quickly. Yeah. Quick, quick lang, quick lang. Okay, attorney. Yes. yes, yeah, thank you. Attorney, uh, regarding the MPSA, Mining Production Sharing Agreement, uh, correct, correct me if I'm wrong because I, I, I've uh, uh, asked this uh, and I, I also... Uh, uh, requested uh, explanation also from my colleagues in the mining industry uh, regarding the uh, uh, permit, na, yung, uh, uh, the MPSA. Um, if, if you try to look at the permit itself, mineral production sharing agreement, the government has to be involved in the production of the resources, right? The, the, the title itself, the, 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 the permit itself, because it's a production sharing agreement. But the way I, I see it, uh, implementing it in the country right now, those who have uh, um, permits, MPSA permits, aside from the FTAA that the, the president and the Congress uh, issue to uh, mining companies, it's not production agreement. What, what, what the, the national government is receiving, even, even the BARM right now, because we have MPSAs operating in uh, the province of Tawi-Tawi, are all taxes. Uh, they are not, they are not, uh, we are not directly involved in the uh, production uh, of, of the, uh, the uh, operation of mines uh, in the province of uh, Tawi Tawi. So I just want to uh, have some clarity on how you understand also this uh, uh, permit uh, given uh, to mining companies uh, under the uh, 7942 of the uh, uh, Mining Act and its uh, implementing rules and regulations issued by the DNR. Thank you. Yes, DJ, that's correct. No, uh, under an MPSA, dapat uh, may share si government in the in the production. No, uh, I think nagkaka problema tayo in the interpretation of the mineral excise tax. Kasi mm. tinawag natin excise tax when when you look at what an excise tax is, it's not proper for minerals. Eh. Yeah. And hindi na lumaki. Di ba? Yeah. yeah. Look at the deliberations in the Mining Act of 1995, there was a proposal not to call it a mineral excise tax, but rather a mineral royalty. Hmm. Because that should be royalty. That's, that's the share of the state in the production. 
So, nagkaroon ng misnomer ngayon, yung share ni government was called an excise tax. Doon tayo nagka, nagka problema. So, I think, moving forward for BARM, instead of an excise tax, you come up with a royalty. Yeah. Kasi I- royalty is what the owner receives. Yeah. Diba? Yes, so attorney. The owner receives as his share in the resource. Okay. Um, thank you. I think we get the message. Uh, in the interest of time, sorry to interrupt, but I think the point there is that that's a red flag or area of contention that hopefully can be resolved uh, when BARM is developing its mining code uh, with respect to that uh, on the MPSA. What's in it? What should be out of it? And how should I actually call it? So I think that's a very important topic. We could need, we cannot resolve it yet. So is your turn. Yeah, um, thank you, Jelson. The yung expansion ng uh, composition or membership ng multi multi partite monitoring teams. It's been a recurring, if I, if I remember it correctly, it's a recurring uh, recommendation in the country reports, the annual country reports, because the annual country reports uh, do not just uh, publish data; it also publishes recommendations from the multi stakeholder group and the independent administrator, and then every year. Uh, the embassy checks what the agencies or the relevant agencies um, have already done to address those recommendations. And I think um, in one of the reports, uh, the MJD has already addressed that, if I'm not mistaken. We'll try to, if we have time, we'll try to drop the exact response of the MJD to that um, concern by the chat box. But if that is uh, a concern for the Bangsamoro government, that is, that is precisely something that uh, you should consider, already consider at the onset when when crafting your uh mining code at the onset already uh, uh include that as a provision that the, comp- the the composition that you want uh for a multipartite monitoring team uh, just so the 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 weaknesses of the current uh um Philippine mining act uh, will not be the same for you for the mining for the mining code of the region um Jelson, uh, so sa wala ko na ko din sa usapan din na DG, mabilis-abilis lang. Um, din sa fiscal regime na, kasi from the DOF ako, uh, sa fiscal regime ng uh, DOF, iba pa yung mining royalty dun sa excise tax. Tapos meron ding proposal for additional government share para madagdagan yung government, madagdagan nga yung uh, um, share ng government from from the revenue. So parang magkakaiba pa talaga na category. And we can discuss that in another form. But yun lang, sa sa proposal ng UF magkakaiba pa talaga yun. Thank yes, you, Jess. Thank you. And I know that in underarm they were using the so-called regional wealth tax. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> anyway, uh, and we have uh, further conversation on fiscal regime tomorrow. So we have experts also uh, who can tackle that, and you know them, no? Um, we ha- we supposed to end at eleven thirty, but I think we can extend it for another fifteen minutes because we're saving the the best for last, if you can put it that way. But thank you, uh, Mr. Jerry Balugo uh, uh, from the uh, uh, Fox Libera Mining Incorporated for patiently waiting. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey Balugo is the head for safety, health, environment, and community relations department. And he has been actively participating in the a previous stakeholder consultation and validation that led to this report. So. It's good to have him again. So it's your turn, Mr. Jeffrey Palugo. Hi, good morning. Um, good morning, all. I'm Jeff. I'm from Pax Libera Mining. Um, sir, there was no pressure in saying that saving the best for last. <laughs> anyway, um, I only have a few points regarding this uh, discussion for this morning. Um, regarding the, the first three speakers have pointed out um, the, the, the points well. Um, so I'll go straight to my reaction regarding the what has been discussed earlier. Um, basically, in crafting the mine um, code for BARM, as what I have reiterated during the July, uh, June, I think it was in June 2021, um, validation consultation conducted in Tawi-Tawi, um, we should look at the Philippine mine laws because I believe that that the existing Philippine mine law is actually um, a stringent one. It's just that the implementation of it is quite flawed. So 
maybe the good practices with existing Philippine mine laws should be adopted and incorporated in the uh, BARM mining code. So as a representative from the industry itself, as what I have saw on the field, um, grassroots, as you may uh, call it, there are some points that I would like to incorporate in the policy making of the mining law. Um, first is strong government insight. Um, it should be incorporated into the policy making since what I have experienced since um, from ARM, then transition to BARM, um, we have to capacitate first those who oversee the mining operations in the area for them to be able to implement the mining law that will be created soon. Um, experts should be put in place, but luckily now the BARM has, I met some of them, um, they're uh, SMEs already in their fields. So that's a good thing. Second is, this is regarding, um, the main concern of my points here is the social development program and the environmental uh, management programs. So I think um, it would also be nice to incorporate in the policy making the robust audit of the programs and activities for SDMP and EPEP. Although Pax Libera has been um, religiously following the Philippine mine law in the absence of mining code in BARM. Um, as what I can see from the local um, government unit or for, for, from, the, from the base of the operation in the, in the uh, impacted community, most of the government officials, no offense, uh, but most of the government officials in the local government does not understand how SDMP and EPEP programs work. So part of our responsibility is we conducted IEC for them to be educated on how these things work, how these um, policies work. So each and every start of the mining season, we submit to the MMT and to the regional government our plan for the, for the year. So basically we base our SDMP spending on the 1.5% um, operational cost which is directed by the Philippine Mine Law. So whatever our um, one point, uh, our expenses for the projected expenses for the year, 1.5 of it is being put into the social development and management program in which um, subdivided into sections for livelihood, capacity building, education, health, infrastructure, and socio-cultural aspects. So the 1.5% from the SDMP budget that we allocated for the mining year is um, divided uh, by sector. So we submit that document and we have that approved uh, at the regional level. But before the formulation of that social development uh, program, we actually conducted um, consultations at the community to address what are the needs of the, low, of the host community and the local government itself. But there are challenges that we faced in the past six years or uh, five or six years. Um, there were challenges that, for example, the Pax, Pax Libera Mining Company has been um, facing. Like, for example, the local government doesn't have their, for example, the Barangay Development Plan is not formulated. Municipal Development Plan is vague. So, what we incorporated in the social development and management program are the immediate um, needs based on the consultation that we conducted. So as what the MMT um, observed during their visits and with the reports, um, the projects that we conducted caters to what is the immediate need of the community. So I think it would also be nice um, if the local government of the host barangay or host municipality um, will be capacitated enough to formulate this development plan so that we can inline our social development and management programs with their um, projects. Um, next is regarding the environmental management program as well. Um, Currently, Pax Libera is 
practicing a progressive rehabilitation scheme in which, um, although we haven't declared that we are mined out yet, but those areas that are not are no longer um, active for the mining activities, we started rehabilitating it so that by the time that we enter the, the decommissioning phase, we are already ready and some of the areas already rehabilitated. Um, what else? Uh, basically, uh, what I wanted to, to react about has already been thoroughly discussed by the previous speakers and the previous reactors. And I'll stick to those uh, two major points that I have already said. I think that's it. Hey, I always like your well thought out and well considered uh, interventions. It sounds to us like these are already specific recommendations that you would like to be considered uh, in the mining code. Noting, for example, that while we have a very stringent uh, Philippine Mining Act, uh, the enforcement is always a challenge. And so I think hopefully this can also be uh, addressed in the crafting and deliberation of the mining code. Also, you emphasize the importance of a strong government oversight, not just for uh, monitoring compliance, but to ensure that the uh, uh, development plans are actually uh, reported and actually captured. Hence the importance of a robust audit on the implementation and outcomes of the SDMP in the Environmental Conservation and Protection Program. Uh, I think uh, this is not necessarily a question, but more of a recommendations, right? And you made it very clear also from the previous uh, validation, which I believe we have incorporated in the, in the final iteration of the report. But I think it would be good actually to, to hear, because the way I would like to do it now is first, uh, I'd like to have some last um, say message or response from our uh, speakers. And also if DJ Ali is still uh, with us, uh, I would like to invite him also. And then I'll try to give like a five, uh, five point summary of what we have discussed here. No? So, okay. Um, DJ Ali, are you still there? Would you like to respond not just to uh, Jeffrey, but also overall about what you have heard? Then we go to um, Attorney Residoro, uh, and then East, and then Pak Ananda. And hopefully we can have a group photo also. We didn't manage to have a group photo. Maybe we can do that later. Okay, DJ Ali, are still in the room? Okay, if not, then I think I'd like to ask uh, Attorney Residoro some last, uh, last message. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Jerson. No, medyo nahuli mo na naman ako. Uh, well, in closing, I'm, I'm thankful for the invitation. No? I think this is, uh, like I said in my presentation kanina, this is not just good, it's necessary uh, that the Bank Samoro really focus on developing a progressive, responsive um, mineral regulatory law. No? They are in a very good position now to correct the wrongs of the Mining Act to improve on its uh, aged concepts and to be more forward looking, more uh, responsive to the needs of the people and focusing on sustainability. Um, I, I think naman, I, I put forward uh, what I think are the key features that need to be there. And um, I'm happy that uh, there are discussions like this going on. And I'm thankful to Bantaykita for organizing uh, efforts like this. Para we, we all get to see where we are right now and where we want to take this moving forward. Um, for our part in the chamber, we will be more than happy to continue helping uh, not just BK, but also BARM in the development of this uh, new mining law that, uh, that everybody's envisioning. It's... Uh, it's not just good, it's necessary. I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. And, yes, thank you also, Attorney Residoro. Um, and, and we also have, uh, okay, East? 
Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Jason. Five quick points. Number one, congratulations again to DK for the for this uh, new publication. Uh, this is very comprehensive and useful. And also for this event today, thank you for inviting the Department of Finance and the Philippine EITI. Number two, um, again, uh, everything that we discussed today, we hope that uh, everybody, especially the uh, the the representatives from the Bangsa Moro government, have uh, uh, taken note of the discussions and uh, at the onset. Um, consider them already in the crafting of your uh, mining code, everything that we discussed today. And uh, number three, um, consider uh, adopting the EITI process. And we look forward to working with the Bangsamoro government. Uh, this could be our case for subnationalization um, and systematic disclosure. Uh, sana masundan pa po yung uh, discussions natin last year, magtuli po ito. And then uh, finally, um, I think it will really be helpful that uh, there is an established uh, coordination between the national government and the Bangsa Moro government for uh, for the alignment of uh, priorities and, and initiatives uh, related to the extractive industry. So again, thank you and congratulations to everybody. Thank you, East. Uh, Pak Ananda, are you still with us? Okay, he's probably taking his um, kopiluwak. Uh, but thank you, Pak Ananda, for uh, joining us. And um, I wonder if we could have some last uh, point message also from uh, uh, Mom Arlene, uh, Jeffrey, and also from uh, Director Remo. Um, yes, po. Sana pag ginawa po ang... Uh, BARM Mining Code, Environment and Environmental Code. Um, it will be an in inclusive, ano, inclusive. There will be an inclusive partip participation coming from all stakeholders who will be working for, with, and who will be affected by the mining activities wherever it may be. Thanks, Mom Marlene. And uh, Jeffrey, any last minute? Anything to reiterate from your end? Um, I think I have said my point. Um, I think I just missed one um, regarding the um, pandemic, uh, what will happen to the mining industry after the pandemic. I think um, it's necessary to include that as well in the policy making at the emergency response plan for the mining company, just in case um, another pandemic hits. So I think that would be necessary. And thank you for inviting me and for listening. Yeah, thanks also, Je uh, Jeffrey. Uh, Director Remo? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bantay Kita, for this, uh, Jelson, uh, for, for this uh, discussion. Uh, we will take it seriously regarding on the crafting and uh, possible uh, the formulation of the Bangsamoro Responsible Mining Act. Everything uh, we at Menre, uh, we look forward uh, to the fruitful um, organization and uh, discussion uh, in particular for the uh, ang ating kalikasan. So we, we look forward uh, for tomorrow's uh, open, uh, again, uh, discussion uh, for the second day. Thank you. Thank you, Director Remo. Uh, before we do our group uh, photo, I just want to, I think, highlight some of the top five uh, takeaway, if you like, from this discussion without uh, diluting some of the other essential uh, details. I think number one, in response to some of the key questions that we asked, pandemic, uh, the, the pandemic impact was certainly felt in mining operations, mining companies, mining communities, but its effect is not that severe. Second, there certainly is the need to prioritize the development of a mining code, which is should be robust. robust. And, um, and it should also be uh, under the guiding framework of the Bangsamoro Organic Law, and we can also take some of the positive features of the Philippine Mining Act's uh, uh, very stringent measures, but recognizing some of the implementation challenges. Number three, um, there's also the need to not only have a robust mining code, but also the importance of 
strengthening the institutional implementation capacity of key agencies, including the MENRE, which has a, an expanded mandate in also ensuring that all the significant uh, provisions from environmental to license provisions to monitoring and others are very well handled in that entails uh, allocation of uh, uh, resources, not just in terms of money, but also the staffing complement, the importance of capacity, uh, not just at the regional level, but all the way to project level implementation. Number five, uh, it's been mentioned in by all the speakers about the Im importance of looking at some of the key features or provisions of the Philippine Mining Act. Also, the principles of EITI uh, that should hopefully be considered in the mining code. And it's good to hear from them that there are some alignment on some of the things that in the past seem to be allergic to some people uh, for them to hear, for example, progressive taxation, stroke oversight of the government, uh, also um, the importance of linking uh, the revenue uh, sharing mechanism, but also revenue management and how this is linked, not just with the project development, but also with the municipal and regional development strategy. I think this has been uh, reinforced in the previous uh, uh, interventions. And number five, uh, there certainly are benefits of uh, BAM government as uh, to become a member or seek partnership with the EITI, not just in terms of uh, uh, obtaining data, but, but I think this is important, obtaining data, updated current data uh, on the tax payment, uh, revenue payments, revenue sharing, but also on how this gets spent on the environmental protection, social development and others. Uh, and so it's good to hear from PHEITI that engaging with the BARM is one of their, is in their work plan. So hopefully with a discussion like this, uh, it catalyzed further this uh, efforts on, on, on both sides to talk about things that can be done in the immediate term and incrementally how this can feed into other medium term priorities of, uh, of, of Mendre and others, including the crafting of a robust mining law in its implementation uh, uh, rules and regulations. So I think those are the five takeaways that I got from this conversation. Now, let me also take this opportunity to also uh, invite you to a relevant discussion tomorrow. In fact, we're going to discuss the other part of the report, which is on the fiscal side of things. Um, this is already advertised and tomorrow we're going to tackle the mining fiscal policy for sustainable development lessons that we could draw from the Philippines and other countries such as Peru for BAMS mining, uh, mining and fiscal autonomy. And we have the uh, subject matter experts here. We have people from, uh, the, from UP, um, also from Peru, and uh, we have reactors again from Bangsamoro. I think we have an equally, uh, 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 I would say, very good uh, speakers tomorrow to again deepen the conversation that hopefully could also feed into the discussion of the mining and other relevant sector strategy development. So, on that note, thank you, everyone. I would like to thank again our huge thanks to uh, Institute for Autonomy and Governance, not just for facilitating this, but providing us the platform to reach a wider audience because you have your own set of networks that Bantekita still doesn't have. So by combining these forces, we hope that we are broadening the conversation. No? And also with the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources and Energy, uh, you are not here physically present, but in terms of spirit and your participation is strongly felt. And I think that we have a conversation with you uh, after this as well. So on that note, thank you very much, everyone. And I think we can have a group photo. So if you could stay in and uh, open your uh, video, uh, please open so that we can be included in the group photo, which is currently being uh, screenshot now. So. Give us your best smile. One, 
May lang po ng mga 15 seconds. We have three slides for the photo. Okay. One, two, three. Oh. All right. So thank you, everybody. And uh, see you again tomorrow, same time, 8.30 to 11.30. Um, so thank you. And uh, for those who would like to ask for a copy of the report, this will soon be published on Bantay Kita. And we, I think we can make that also available to IAG, which is a little bit of a blurb, no? And I think we can also share this presentation if that's to be requested. So again, thank you. Have a good lunch, everybody. Uh, uh, maraming salamat po. And for our friend in Indonesia, Pak Ananda, thank you. And see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Maraming salamat po for inviting us. Hope to listen tomorrow. Thank you.